Good morning, everyone. Brooke Grimsley here alongside Danny Mac. Rainy character with the rest of the week off. He is in Arizona. Danny, we did a little bit of a switcheroo. So I just got back from Arizona for my bachelorette trip. And Randy is kind of doing his own <laughs> trip to Arizona. I said I would send over my itinerary yesterday in case he wants to do the same things that we did. A lot of girls nights. We even had a pink night. So maybe that's something that Randy can enjoy down there. Did in you Arizona. run into him? No, no. I, mean, I was kind of hoping yeah. that I would be able to see him. Just have him jump into the bachelorette party. He'd fit in just oh so well with a younger generation. As you know, Randy is able to deviate from his schedule of watching probably NBA games and who knows, some spring training games. That's what he does. That's what he loves. So he would have been perfect to crash your party, if you will. Dan, you know, I feel like he would have enjoyed one day of the bachelorette party as opposed to i don't know one of those silly spring training games down there i feel like he would have enjoyed at least one day of that uh yeah probably i could see him jumping in <laughs> I, i'll go back to it i think he'd crash the party he'd be like hey girls what's up ladies i'm here to crash the yeah. party yeah, I, i'm here to party yeah, yeah. What do you got? That's Randy. He could have fit in on Cabana Boy Day. <laughs> he, he would have fit Would you wanted right him to be in. a Cabana Boy? A hundred percent. I think the Cabana Boys were just there to really liven up the party, Dan. That's all that they were there for. They had some games to play with us, all that different kind of stuff. Randy would have been the perfect Cabana Boy. A good, it would be a good side gig. Now, him. let me let me go back to something you just said. So, liven up the party? Yeah. How'd they liven up the party? So just games. They oh, just had okay. games for us. What kind of games? What a you great, know, just, just journalism games. happening right now. I, I'm this, just trying to figure out what happens this at is a great, party. These, these questions are fantastic. Is this, what it, is this what it feels like to be in the hot seat as a player when you say something you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have opened that door Brooke, a little I'm bit. I'm just curious. This yeah, is my I, curiosity. I also, yeah, I would also, I'm, frankly, uh, hold on. if I'm a hold driver, on, hold on, hold I'm on. a little confused right now. I'm a hard-hitting journalist, okay? This is what I'm trying to get to the bottom of, and you're helping out a lot of people, a lot of young ladies that are listening to this show about how to run a bachelorette party. So you're giving them all the ideas of what to do. Well, it's 7.02, your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, <laughs> a Rolex license a jeweler, by the way. Um, I'm a little worried about kids getting dropped off, but it was very, very simple. Just games, you know, we, we also, you know, pop. They taught me how to pop a bottle, you know, where you do the knife the really fancy way. Okay. They taught me how to do that and just games they took photos for us now what kind of games though are you playing like trivia games like hey let's have a trivia night yeah you know here? like the fight like we did sports trivia oh, okay. totally that's what All happened right. yeah and speaking of which the blues you see how i'm gonna i'm gonna do what you do dan All i'm right, gonna you deviate transition. you know that's i'm gonna fine. deviate away from this because my mom and dad are listening uh blues <laughs> and bruins playing last night something that fans here in st louis always love to hear is when the blues beat up on the bruins and last night the final score five to one to end their five game road trip on a high note at least the first school tonight it's everybody that you knew where it was going to come from right it was Casper Kapanen he had a big night that line had a big night Saad Hayes Kapanen they started the night with at the top line with Shen Thomas Kairou Bolduk Buchnevich neighbors on the second line and then they started to change it up as they went along in the first period and if I'm Drew Bannister I would do the same thing it, this is the personnel I got things weren't working they were 4 11 and 7 they are now in their last 11 games so you're saying I got to change something up try to do something different but that third line was the one that really stepped up last night isn't that exciting Are you were you were expecting that weren't you from that third line I mean Kevin Hayes obviously a little bit of a homecoming for Kevin and Hayes there so he performed really well but as you mentioned seven points just from that line where has that been all season I don't know and Kapanen where's he been all season where has Saad been all season where has Scott Sunquist been all season where has uh, Shen been all season I, I mean you can look at any of these guys and say they have not performed to the level where they need to be in their last 11 games it was only their second road win in that stretch first periods have been a problem that was not the case last night they had been outscored 26 to 9 prior to last night in the first and the third period so when you want to get off to good starts they hadn't done that when you want to finish off games and those last 11 games go back to nashville if they win that game at home maybe it's a different story here with this stretch run towards the trade deadline that they had but in first and third periods they just have not played well and you try to get off to a good start you try to close a game well and they just have not done that but last night was fun to watch and if you had that on your bingo card a 5-1 win
well, you're just a better person than I am. Well, and also if you had Kapanen with that goal on your bingo card, then we yeah. need to talk about lottery tickets because I was not expecting that. You like to see it. It's just what we were hoping to see from him a little bit more this season. It's not like my expectations were high, but I was at least hoping to see a little bit more from him. And also you've had Robert Thomas with the power play goal. What I liked about that is how aggressive he was. You didn't see the waiting around. You didn't see the passing, looking for looks. It's just that he shot that one timer. And that's something that you want to see from the Blues power play at times. I wish he would shoot the puck more, to be quite honest. He seems to be pass first, and he has had, I mean, this is nitpicking because yeah. he's had a great year. Um, I also was thinking about the last guys that were in Boston for the Stanley Cup. Folks, there's only a few left. Bennington, Shen, the aforementioned Thomas, Pareko, Sammy Blay. Who am I missing? And uh, Oscar Sundquist, that's the mm -hmm. other one. So there's only six guys that are remaining from the Stanley Cup team. I, I thought, speaking of Bennington, I thought that the goalie tandem, when you look at Holfer and how he played last night, you look at Bennington, how he's played all year, God knows where this team would be without those two because they have been outstanding at times this year. They're the reason that I believe this season, one, the Blues have been able to be at least competitive and stay in games. And Jordan Bennington looks exactly, I always hate to always compare him back to his 2019 self, but that was the best version of Jordan Bennington. So we're always going to do that. But it really does feel like he's getting back to that. Joel Hofer, as you mentioned, by the way, with 36 saves last night, a great performance for him. But really, the goaltending has been the highlight of the season for me for the Blues. They're on pace for 84 points. It's going to take mid-90s just to make it into to the eighth spot in the it, it have a chance at the playoffs and there's still a chance mathematically alive but it's going to be really tough for them they're gonna they're gonna have to go on a stretch that they haven't done all year and who knows sports are weird things can happen but i probably don't see that happening right now you're saying that 2019 magic is not left over at this point the 2019 team had players <laughs> they had really it was more good, than magic <laughs> they had really good players and I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't some players on this team because i do believe there there are some very good players but the depth just isn't there like we saw a few years ago also another special moment i just wanted to point this out because the Blues scored five goals and they did it on Bobby Plager's birthday. That's pretty cool. I feel like we all have so many great memories. I feel very lucky that I was able to get to know him really well, especially during that Blues Stanley Cup run. Dan, as you know, he was always walking around with his coffee, pacing around, watching the Blues at games at Enterprise Center, and he cared so much about this team, every little thing. What is your favorite memory? Of uh, just being around him. You know, I, I did the Blues for a number of years doing the pregame shows and the postgame and uh, did the intermissions on both radio and TV, and he'd be around there just giving me trouble when I'd be <laughs> right around outside the locker room and he'd be hanging out. He'd be making faces behind me in the interviews, behind the, the scenes and the camera and things like that. I loved it. I thought it was fun. I didn't care. I know some people are like, stop, stop. I'm like, no, keep it going. This is fun. It's supposed to be fun. This is sports. It's not life or death. And, you know, he made it a lot of fun for me. So that's that's what just right off the right off the top of my head, that's what comes to mind with Bobby Plager. I know. I miss seeing him in the press box, and he always had his coffee in hand, and you'd go over and check on him. If the game was going bad, he would definitely let you know that things were going bad, and he yes. pointed out for you. And he, in my opinion, is the epitome of a true blue. So we have the text line open, which is 314-399-9646. 314-399-Yo-ho. Oh, Dan, I thought you were about to lead right into it. No chance that was happening. I think I'm just staying away. 9646. <laughs> so we're going to try to get into some of those uh, text line and uh, what do you call it? They're not emails, but texts, I guess, since it's text. called the text line. Yeah, and or then you, you can do a mic drop. And that's the other thing. I want to hear from fans, too, what they think right now with some of the subjects that we get into, because it's not only going to be the Blues, but we have a bunch of people coming up on the show, and there was a lot of things that happened with the NFL yesterday. You got stuff with the Cardinals down in Jupiter, so there's a lot to get into. Speaking of which, with the Cardinals in Jupiter, a little bit surprising, I guess, yesterday, considering that Sonny Gray was out with a hamstring injury, and then you saw him out on the mound. He had a 20-pitch light bullpen session yesterday. The Cardinals saying that he will have another bullpen, bullpen session later this week on Wednesday or Thursday. And then they'll see maybe if he's possibly going to be ready for opening day. Was it a little surprising to you to see him back on the mound so quickly? Uh, not not really. Um, I, I figured that he took himself out because he knows that hamstring better than anybody. 
Clearly he does. And when players get hurt, I always say they know their body better than anybody. They know it better than the trainers, the doctors. They know how far a veteran knows how far he can push it. Where I'd very, where I'd be very cautious is the fact that this is on the side and this is not live action, mm -hmm. and you seem to push it a little bit harder when there's a guy in the uh, in the batter's box, and so I want to see him get back on the mound. It's it's one thing in a, in a real game or even a spring training game. It's one thing to throw on the side and try to keep your arm ready. It's another thing when you're not max effort uh, on that side session as opposed to when you're in a game and letting it loose. And that would be my concern moving forward with uh, with Sonny Gray. Maybe it's just me personally, but I would rather him maybe start out the year just very briefly on the injured list if that meant that we knew that he would be completely fine for the rest of the season. I'm 100% with you. And the other thing, too, that I would look at is Tommy Edmond, who does not look like, by the way, he's going to make opening day. But I'd no. be really cautious with him. Wrist injuries are, are nothing to mess with, especially swinging a bat. And the other guy that I, as much as he wants to be out there, I'm sure is Lars Newpar. So what happens now, it complicates. It's not ideal. It's a setback and it's not what you want in terms of where the Cardinals might be uh, with their outfield setup. But I, you know, it's one thing if it's opening day, players want to get out there. They push themselves to be available for opening day. But I would say, you know what, uh, take extra caution with these guys and make sure they're there for the long haul. You don't want to push them. And you mentioned with some other NFL news happening, a lot of things happening. I want to start with this because you weren't here yesterday for this, but we talked about the Falcons. They solve their quarterback issues with bringing in Russell Wilson. And then also yesterday, you have Kirk Cousins going to the Falcons. I don't know if I'm surprised, shocked, or how to feel about these situations. Well, you got Baker Mayfield agreeing to sign a three-year, $100 million deal. You got Wilson going to the Steelers. So Pittsburgh just got 10 times more interesting when you think about what happens there. Uh, the Patriots trade Jones to the Jaguars. You look at Chris Jones and his deal with Kansas City. So there is a lot of movement right now. You mentioned the Atlanta Falcons. Interesting what they're going to have on offense. They got Kirk Cousins, quarterback. B. John Robinson, top pick from a year ago at running back. They got Drake London, a wide receiver, and they got Kyle Pitts, a tight end. They're going to be able to score some points next year. I think they're going to be an interesting team to watch for sure. And Kirk Cousins' deal is reportedly worth $180 million. That's $45 million per season, including a $100 million guarantee. Do you think he's going to be worth that money, even with the recent injury? I think the NFC South is really good again because of Kirk Cousins. Four years, $180 million. Who would have thought that a few years ago with $100 million? Million guaranteed. Kirk Cousins, of all people, <laughs> is dictating what may happen here in free agency. I thought the other thing that I took from yesterday's that some of the running backs are back. Uh, Saquon Barkley signing with Philadelphia. I thought that was interesting. Josh Jacobs uh, lands in Green Bay. Austin Eckler with the Commanders. DeAndre Swift with the Bears. Tony Pollard with the Titans. Gus Edwards with the Chargers. Giants and Chargers are going for it on defense. They made a bunch of picks are a bunch of uh, move on defense and what are the Bengals going to do now that wideout T Higgins has said I want to trade so those are just some of the headlines heading into day two of what do they call it it's free but it's the it's kind it, of the negotiating they, period yes the, it is the negotiating and we have to put period that, you, if you go to the YouTube you can see that we're doing air quotes there and, <laughs> and here's the thing I like that they get things moving. There's constantly something to talk about. We've discussed about with Major League Baseball, sometimes that's the issue and maybe why you need to have a period of time where you have action going on because, by the way, you still have some of your starting top starting pitchers out there who haven't landed with the team. Meanwhile, you have a plethora of moves that are happening in the NFL. It seems like there's big news every single day. 314 says legal tampering period. Legal tampering period. Okay. I need to remember that next time that uh, free agency fires up. So this is free agency, right? It is. Legal I, tampering I period. Legally, Tamp I thought the legal tampering period was the period before the negotiation period. To me, it I feels like I thought they were like different it. things. So you're telling me that when they go to um, the combine, there isn't some guy saying, hey, by the way, would you think about a four-year deal? We're thinking roughly 120 with 70 million guaranteed. I know this is not the legal tampering period. I just want you to I think, think about this during the trouble. illegal tampering period. Legal. Okay, got it. So basically, I, I remember people making. Everyone was making. You know, Twitter has 
themes. And everyone's always, every year, the legal tampering jokes is just takes over for a day. And But then... Today, like yesterday, I was seeing negotiation period. So I feel like when I hear the buzzwords, yeah. I feel like there's a different thing. Like I feel like it's the, just the, safety the words. Good, the NFL is okay. good at using like yeah buzzwords and safety words and things like that to be like it's a new thing because I think it helps Sports Center like you know Chiron it easier and that makes it, the entire you know 365 day thing work with the news cycle. But yeah, it's some it's something with the NFL. People are signing deals. They're also every deal is a lie, by the way. So uh, it's not what it's, it seems. Uh, the agents are fudging it. So the Google machine is telling me that it allows teams to start negotiations with the representatives of unrestricted free agents. And so to me, though, it's basically free agency. Yeah. That's what this is. hundred uh, percent. Now, your, your guy, Derrick Henry, did not sign with anybody. No, it seems like the running back market is a little bit skewed or different this year. And he is 30 years old. So I do understand the concern. It seems like a lot of teams are more hesitant with running backs of that age. And they feel like if I have a fifth round pick or a sixth round pick, I can, can figure go, out yeah. where you know the running back market is going to be. I can find a running back. I thought it was interesting with the Dallas Cowboys. I think it was Dak Prescott's brother and Parsons' yes. brother came out and was tweeting about, well, I guess I'm paraphrasing, but this organization is not going to do anything. They're going to stand pat. And I find it really interesting. When you have a family member that comes out and says something, just be quiet. You don't need to. It just adds to the headache of the player. It There's does. nothing good that comes out of you doing that. Nothing. It's not helpful. And if anything, it's a huge, giant distraction. Oh. But, but, you know, it's kind of like your parents always want to defend you. Your family members want to defend you. But you have to have, I feel like if you're at that level, the conversation of please stay off social media. I can handle this on my own. I have agents for a reason. I don't need you to post in my defense. Defend what? Exactly. I mean, what are you defending? That the guy's still going to get paid and, you know what, It uh, they're still going to look at keep. I mean, you think Parsons is going anywhere? No. No. Do you think that uh, Dak Pres Prescott's going to probably get another deal? Yes. So it just doesn't do anything. There's no benefit to it. I just want to be technically correct. Uh, there is a benefit to it. Thank you for giving a us something to talk oh, about. Oh, fodder. Yeah, thank you. No, no, there is a benefit. <laughs> Never stop siblings and significant others of much more famous people than themselves. You keep this thing churning, and I appreciate that. All right, well, we should get rolling. Look, today... We're going to be a little bit more free-flowing. We're going to have some fun with a lot of different conversations. As Danny Mac mentioned, make sure you get your text in because coming up here at 715, we're going to talk about the Cardinals opening day outfield, question mark, because as we mentioned, a lot of injuries and changes happening. And so we're going to discuss, is this a winning outfield for the Cardinals currently without Lars Newbar and Tommy Edmond? That's coming up next here on the opening drive.
I think Alec Burleson's going to win that job and left. Uh, you, you know, so far, uh, he leads the Cardinals with nine hits this spring. They really were blunt with him. They were honest with him this offseason. They told him, you need to get better. You need to lose weight. You need to be somebody we can trust in the outfield. And, you know, he's come back. He's taken that serious. That is John Denton of MLB.com. He was on with us yesterday when we were talking about the outfield. By the way, in case you have somehow missed this, the Cardinals, two-thirds of the starting outfield that they were hoping to have for opening day is seems like it's not going to happen anymore. We talked about Tommy Edmond a little bit earlier. He's still dealing with the wrist surgery that he had and it seems like he's taking a little bit longer than expected to recover then you have Lars Newtbar with his recent injury that will keep him out for likely around two weeks and you don't want to push it so now this pushes forward two guys who have a chance to really take those openings those jobs and that would be Alec Burleson and it would be Dylan Carlson now how do you feel about this opening day outfield? Is this an opening day outfield? Just say theoretically things do not go as planned with Lars Newtbar and Tommy Edmund. It takes a little bit longer as expected going into the season. Is this a winning outfield currently with the addition of Jordan Walker for the Cardinals? Well, I think it's a setback. Um, and there's no other way to look at it that it is a setback for the club because you look at their defense from a year ago, and this includes Carlson. It was way down. Now, when Tommy Edmund went into center, it improved. And so I just think it's a setback, you know, when you have this group, Burleson, Carlson, Walker would be your opening day outfield, and then Michael Ciani would come off the bench. I don't think that Victor Scott's going to make this team. You would have to add him to the 40-man roster. I also think because he hasn't played above double A, that would be uh, something to think about, too. It is only spring training. I kind of compare him to Mason Wynn, where Mason Wynn opened up a lot of eyes in spring training last year, and clearly he needed more seasoning. And I, I think that Victor Scott needs more seasoning as you move forward, so it looks like this would be the group of four again not ideal it's set back but we were talking earlier just get these guys healthy now if we were talking like in june or july it wouldn't have i don't think the focus as much as we talk about on opening day and with the way that things start with four in la and then three in san diego it does make it tough you want your full complement of players but you know, it is what it is, and they're going to have to deal with injuries. And looking at the positives and negatives for Dylan Carlson and for Alec Burleson, it seems like two very different players that you almost wish you can combine into one super outfielder. Because with Alec Burleson, as he was discussing there, it seems like they made sure this offseason to give more of an emphasis to him, one, on getting in better shape, because we know that he's not exactly, I'm trying to think of the nicest way to phrase this, he's not speedy. He's not a speedy guy. He's not the most nimble out there in the outfield. It seems like that's something they wanted him to improve. Minus four in defensive runs saved last season. Not much speed there. And then with Dylan Carlson, he's a switch hitter. But it seems like every single season we talk about his issues about if he really can hit from both sides. This is a chance to take the job and run with it. You know, make sure that they look at you and a different light because right now Dylan Carlson if everything was equal and guys were healthy he's your fourth outfielder and Dylan Carlson has a chance to make an impression and say I'm more than a fourth outfielder I need to be part of this team more than just getting playing time here or there take it or leave it does it say uh, Alec Burleson could be our next Matt Holiday with his great hitting and okay defense uh, no um, Matt, <laughs> Matt, Matt Holiday was a stud uh, Dan, what do you mean um, <laughs> Yeah, Matt Holiday like, is a, the essence. You well, know, it's not it's not prime rib, but like it's you know, is it is it like, kind of like a, a, ch a hamburger that's a similar kind of feel to it? You know what I'm saying? Well, they did say that Alec Burleson lost some weight, so I'm I don't know saying. if I throw in a cheeseburger oh, in there. <laughs> hamburger. <laughs> you had to take it to the worst possible. No, I don't know. I'm not insulted the guy so by calling him ground chuck. Maybe a better comparison <laughs> would be a strip k a strip a strip steak compared to a fillet. Is yes, that what we're doing there? Like okay. Okay. Better cut of meat. Um, I, Matt Holiday was an absolute stud and he's a Cardinal Hall of Famer so do you think that Alec Burleson's going to be a Cardinal Hall of Famer no I don't and do I think he's going to be an everyday player probably not when everybody is healthy but the one thing this guy can do he can flat out hit and as John Denton said he leads a club and hits down in spring training and 
I would say this, that the concern for me with the Cardinals was that there was not an everyday fixed lineup that you saw day in and day out last year. Now, that's typical across Major League Baseball. There are mixes and matches and righties and lefties. The Atlanta Braves are kind of an anomaly because they just roll out the same lineup every day. But with this is the defense, and will they suffer defensively? I think that's more the question for this group of outfielders than it is what they're going to bring offensively because I think Burleson's going to hit. I know Walker's going to hit, and the question mark would be Dylan Carlson. Dylan Carlson, with him being a switch hitter, do you almost wish that they would kind of abandon that notion of him being a switch hitter and just have him focus on, I mean, I don't know why he just doesn't bat right-handed all the time. They've talked about it, and they talked about that with Tommy Edmond as well. Now, that was a few years ago in which they, you know, broached the subject with these guys, and it's something to think about, but, you know, they want to make sure that uh, that these guys – if they're comfortable going on both sides of the plate, unless the numbers are just egregious starting this year or for a half a year, then it's something you think about. Like Tommy Edmond went righty righty a few times mm -hmm. and he said it was because of the pitch selection that he was facing. It, it benefited him. And so that was something that he liked. Now this is from the uh, gateway dream fields, put Donovan and left Burleson as DH. I think you may see that towards the end of spring training if Donovan can get his and feels like his arm is healthy. They've moved him. He's played a little bit of short. You know he can play second. Mm -hmm. He's playing a little bit of third base. And I, here's what I would do. I would just say to my shortstop, if there's a base hit, go out, way out. Don't make him throw all that much and put a lot of pressure on his arm. Flip side of that is that other teams know that, and then we try to try to take an extra base on them. But I do think that uh, putting Donovan as left is certainly in left is certainly on the table. That was honestly one of my first ideas. But then I know obviously he underwent surgery for flexor tendon, and that's what it was, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and so he underwent surgery for that. Well, that would be my big concern. I'm sure theirs as well is that you might rush him a little bit too much. So this is interesting from the 636, Dan. The current outfield for the Cardinals with Edmund and Newt Barr out is not going to be a winning outfield long term. I consider it a short term patch. However, someone could surprise us and show that they could take advantage of that opportunity. I think this is why Victor Scott is so interesting. And John didn't. He did squash our dreams a little bit of that yesterday. It's just that Victor Scott, I think, is something that fans are really wanting to see because of his speed, because of his ability. It feels like something you want to have here currently in the majors. Defensive its prowess is not a liability. You want a gold glove in the minor leagues. Those are limited at the positions throughout the entire minor leagues. Um, his speed plays clearly nearly 100 stolen bases. Uh, but I, I just think he, he's not on the 40-man roster. He has not played above double A. I would think that seasoning, a little bit more seasoning is probably beneficial for him. But do I think we'll see him in the major leagues at some point this year? Absolutely. And if guys get off to really poor starts and you need a spark, bring him up. Sometimes that happens where the speed plays and you get a spark and you're not going to lose anything defensively, bring him up. But do I think that he would break camp with this team? No, I don't. <laughs> this is a funny one. So say what you want from the 901. Say what you want about the way to Burley, but Randy always says, can't pull fat. He's good for 162. <laughs> and that's the thing here is that health we knew was going to be a big concern for the Cardinals this season. They could accomplish this or that if they stayed healthy. And now you have this situation in the outfield once again. You want guys. That's the biggest thing is that you have to be fully available, fully healthy going into the season. And this really could determine this opportunity opening up even more where it's more than just a short-term window for Burley and for Carlson. Well, Burleson is going to get his at-bats and where you have to – look at what you need to do with him you got left field probably can play right field you got designated hitter and if goldie needs a time to where you just put him off his feet and make him a dh or give him a full day off he can play first base so instead of looking right now at where you put dylan carlson i'm trying to figure out how to get at, at bats for uh alec burleson and i think you'll get him as you move forward but he's the kind of guy that makes this really interesting and that's why i love spring training and it's, there's always a storyline absolutely there? that's saying i'm broke coming up we have something very interesting that we want to hear from you guys if you could get one piece of sports memorabilia but you could never sell it what are you taking i kind of went down a rabbit hole last night on the internet looking at what is actually available and dan i found some interesting stuff so that's coming up next year on the opening drive
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues last night with a big 5 1 win over the Boston Bruins. I think they get back in the winning column. They will come home for a four game stretch starting with the LA Kings on Wednesday evening. That's a 6 30 p.m. puck drop. You can catch the pregame show right here on 101 ESPN, your home for the St. Louis Blues. We're also going to be talking more Blues coming up later with the voice of the Blues on the television, John Kelly. Also coming up later on in the show, Cardinals analyst, former Major League pitcher and former 101 host Brad Thompson joins us at 845 and we'll be talking Billikens as they get ready for the A-10 tournament with their analyst Earl Austin Jr. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? the opening drive Brooke Danny Mac and Rocky O here and we have a question for you guys so if you were able to get one piece of sports memorabilia but you can never sell it what are you taking we're getting a lot of texts in right now but we want to hear more from you guys so text into the air comfort service text line that is 314-399-9646-314-399 yo ho Dan, are we going to get one yo-ho from I you I did today? it earlier. You did? Yeah, okay, it counts. I, I guess it counted. My it, it, here's my goal. I'm going to try to get more than one out of you the Dang. rest of this week. Yeah, you can try. I'm a very persistent person. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> you, of which, if you could have, Dan, one piece of sports memorabilia, but you can never sell it, what are you taking? Uh, Jackie Robinson's signed contract to come in uh, Major League Baseball. <laughs> that would be the one I want oh, with the social good. significance and what it means. Um, I think it would be one of the greatest pieces of sports memorabilia that you could possibly own. Uh, I wouldn't sell it if the Hall of Fame wanted it or the National Archives wanted it. I would give it to them. But if I had to keep it and I get to keep it, Jackie Robinson signed contract to come play baseball. That is a really, really good one. Yeah. Well, you, you would frame it. I would frame it. Um, I would make sure I kept it in a place that it would not. So like when you frame certain things, you can get the, what would you, what's it called? Like the special, so the the sunlight doesn't hit it. I know what you're talking um, about, yeah. It's a special glass that you can put on it. Um, and I'd be very, very careful with it. I'd probably keep it in the dark somewhat so that it never faded. I'd figure out a way to make sure that uh, it, it didn't blend in with the, the paper and I could <laughs> readily see his autograph and see what it's all about um i'll tell you a great story I, I was doing something for stan the man he had passed and so there were some of the things that they were going to sell out of his collection and they asked me to do a video on it, it was incredible the amount of stuff that he had had and one of the great things and this made me think of jackie robinson's contract but one of the great things that he had was a letter that was written to him by ty cobb and it started out where he was kind of going off on Stan the Man. <laughs> and by the end, he's like, you're a great ball player. We love you. Uh, we think I think that you're amazing. By the way, UV glass is what I'm trying to yes. think of. But, um, yeah, it was just it, I read the uh, – and it was handwritten by Ty Cobb to Stan the Man. And I just thought that's – an incredible piece of memorabilia. That is so cool. Yeah. That, just to be able to have that and to see all the different stuff he had. Mine would be, and I saw this was available, Muhammad Ali's Use Gloves and Rope. Now, it was in the Smithsonian. I don't know if it's still there, but how amazing would it be to be able to have that piece? And then even... Was it from a particular fight? I was trying to figure that out, and I couldn't figure out what exactly which fight it was because obviously he had so many. Yeah. But it just was specifically, it was for an archive edition they had for American sports history, and it was in the, Sm Sm the Smithsonian displayed in there. So what was really cool, I was with my buddy uh, Jay Delsing yesterday, and he was telling me about, and you talk about something that is personal and to your heart. So for fans that don't know, people know that Jay Delsing is a great golfer, but his father played in the major leagues yeah. and has a World Series ring that he has that I guess was passed down 
a family heirloom, and he's trying to get that refurbished. But one of the things that he found on the Internet was a contract that he signed with the New York Yankees. And so he was able wow. to buy that piece of memorabilia. Obviously, it means a lot to him and his family, but that would be cool. If you had a dad that played in the major leagues and you found his contract and it got authenticated, they knew it was his, and a chance to get that uh, that contract. The other part, and Jay, if you're listening, I don't know if you are, but a little side note is that Jay Delsing's father, when he was playing for the St. Louis Browns, was the pinch runner for Eddie Goodell. <laughs> so Eddie Goodell, commonly referred to as a little person, walked on four pitches, and he it's a famous moment in St. Louis Browns, St. Louis uh, history, really baseball history. He takes the walk, gets the first base, and Jim Delsing is the pinch runner for Eddie Goodell. Wow. So if I get that scorecard signed by Eddie Goodell and and Jim Delsing, I would I would take that in a heartbeat. That would be something nice. very cool. So cool. So from the three and four, we're getting a lot of good texts in right now. Pulls and his seven hundredth home run ball. I don't know who got it. Um and what happens with those baseballs is that they are authenticated, so mm -hmm. they do know that it's the official ball that was hit. I think the person that caught it sold it at auction. I'm not positive about that, but and Rock is shaking his head yes. It took him like three weeks. So it took him three weeks. How, how much did much? he get for uh, it? Pools hit it late September. The man sold it at an auction for $360,000 in early October. And a lot of times a player will ask or they'll ask the individual that caught it, do you do you want to give it back to the player? And then there's a negotiation that takes place in the clubhouse, like the player will sign a jersey or some bats, and other players are just like, no, nah, I'm good. Just give it to the fan and let him have it. And that's what he said is that he doesn't put too much stake into material things like that. But personally, I would want that back. If I had did something as historic as that, I'd want it back. would be pretty cool. Yeah, I know. To be able to have that and put it in your collection, I would love to see Albert Pujols in his collection of things that he does have, his own memorabilia. 703 would be something I'd want. 700 I want. Uh, 600, 500, these great milestones. He had... It seemed like every night he played that final year, there was a milestone of total bases and all those different things that he collected. I think because of when it happened and the fact that one of my earliest, I think I think it might be my first ever Cardinal memory inside of Bush Stadium, is Big Mac hitting, it was 62 at the time. So any, any honestly, any number after 60 of Big Mac's home run balls, I think like there's a little there's a, there's a there's a little part of me inside that would just like be giddy at that overall because that is literally my first memory is running into Bush Stadium two as the ball is coming off McGuire's bat for 62 because we got to the game late. And I'm oh, you didn't see it? I don't know. I, I literally ran because I saw McGuire was because remember how you had the you had the catwalks the, the yeah. up. up up Bush Stadium too, and they had cameras in the corners of the catwalk that you could so you could see the game if you were out there. I guess if you were smoking, and as I'm running up the catwalk to get to the very top because we had nosebleeds, I see that McGuire's at the plate on the TV, and so I take off sprinting, and so I literally run out. I literally run out into it. Bush Stadium opens up in front of me. I look down. McGuire swings the bat. Bam, 62 right off his bat. It's like the first card member I ever have. So it's that one. And then here's the thing. Can you imagine the, like shadow box you could put together if you had both gloves from uh when uh muhammad ali knocked out sonny liston sure so you have that so you have those two gloves and then you have the big framed like photo of him standing over him in the in one of the greatest sports photos of all time i'm gonna go with muhammad ali's gloves as my secondary one that's what i was saying is that yeah. you, they and it's they're so available as the it's gloves so per and that, the that one from the sonny liston fight? i think that you can still oh, buy it okay. you can i thought we I, just, I thought we just have to come fight. together collectively and put together all of our money that we make and, and yeah. you know, go get that from the three and four jordan first game-worn Air Jordans. I would love that. 314, Jim Craig's American flag that draped over him. I'd love yes. that. Bartman's headphones, the 502. <laughs> Talking about Steve Bartman, and <laughs> that would be pretty That's cool. That's a really good deep cut. It is. I like that. It is. There's, There's a bunch so that are many. coming in. There is. Oh, well, you're telling us to get out of this. I'm, like, enjoying looking at all of these right now. There's so many. This is a funny one. 314, I would take Jerry Jones's Super Bowl rings just so we wouldn't have them anymore. Is that Randy? <laughs> is Randy good. texting in from Arizona Probably. right now? Because that's what that sounds like. Anything with Jerry Jones in a negative light is Randy. That's what you can do. <laughs> that is 100% him. Well, that's Dan. I'm broke. Coming up next, we have Take It or Leave It. So, once again, get your text into the Air Comfort Service text line. That's 314-399-9646. 314-399. Yo ho, take it or leave it is next.
Hey, it's a Tuesday, and I want to tell you about uh, Stewart's American Mortgage. It's Danny Mac here. If you're someone who is looking to purchase a home, refinance, you're looking to consolidate some of that ugly credit card debt, maybe you don't know exactly what direction to go to in any of these things, let me make it easy for you. Call Stewie from Stewart's American Mortgage. He will help you every step of the way. If it's a new home you're looking to purchase, he'll get you to the closing table fast. How fast? Try 10 days. He'll get you the best interest rate possible. Possible. He also has the bagel loan that can help you out too. What is the bagel loan? You may be asking. If you borrow two hundred thousand or more, there's no underwriting fees, no appraisal fees, no title fees, no lender fees, and no closing costs. Stewie is your guy. He makes it easy. Any questions on rates, the industry, the trends? Give Stewart a call. Call him directly. His personal cell phone. You can text him, or even he'll pick up all the time. We hear from ESPN listeners. He'll do that. He helps him out. Here's the number: three one. 314-324-4440, 314-324-4440, or you can Google the bag alone. NMLS number 226715. Morning Drive rolls on at 748 with Brooke Grimsley. I'm Dan McLaughlin. Also, Rock is with us, manning the dials, chiming in, and it's take it or leave it. The number to call, 314. Or this is the number to text, 314-399-9646. Also, we're going to do some mic drops later. What, what time whoa, are we doing whoa, that thing? Whoa, whoa, at what? Dan, 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 Dan. No, I'm not doing it. You just skip past something. That's Very important. I'm, no, I'm we leading are, this we're segment. We're going to be doing so. mic drops and texts on our memorabilia segment at 915 again, Danny. And how do you mic drop? Uh, you can just go to the 101 ESPN app, and okay. you can just go click on the mic drop feature there. Or, again, you can text in at 399-9646. That's a 399-yo-ho. I was leading this segment. There was no yo-hos. It was yo-no. It was yo-no. Yo-no. Dan, I have learned that you are really, really good at just really changing things and just slipping sure. it in where I maybe I wouldn't notice that. But you know how much we love the yo-ho in here. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> uh, take it or leave it. Some of the people who attended the near record cold Kansas City Chiefs playoff game in January had to undergo amputations after suffering frostbite. Take it or leave it. It was worth it. <laughs> I, I'm going to take it. Wait. What? No. no, you want to get take it. You're going to get a toe take it off to go see the Kansas City Chiefs you win a game? get a new one. You know, you can just put a different a little toe on there. Uh, I'm going to leave that. I was in the comfort of my home on my couch. I felt <laughs> great and felt the vibes of that Kansas City game coming through my television. So I was very pleased to be at home. What about the Buffalo fans? What do they know? How are, how are they able to figure this out? I, well, I guess this game was, what, the fourth coldest on record or the third coldest on record? It was with the wind chill. It was nearly minus 30. 
So you had to bundle up. I'm sure the Buffalo Bills fans know all too well how cold it can get. But this is one of the, in terms of how cold it gets, this is one of the coldest games in the history of sports. Well, we were talking about sports memorabilia. That's the one way to remember the game that you're at is that you could keep your toe and you could put it in a little box, you know, a little keepsake, remembering how you <laughs> you lost your toe just to watch that game. So it'd be in a jar? Yeah. Uh-huh. You can put in a little box and a little keepsake. Great story. You can take it around to many different pl places and tell people. Well, take it or leave it, guys. Russell Wilson, as we mentioned, to the Steelers, Kirk Cousins to the Falcons. The Justin Fields trade market is now dwindling. Take it or leave it. It's Raiders or bust for him and the Bears. I could see a team because there was over, what, 50 different QBs. I'm going to leave it, but uh, I don't think he's going to go to the Raiders. But because there are so many guys that get hurt, at that position i could see a team saying come on in you'll be our backup we'd be happy to have you as a backup why not why not do it i think they just want to get some sort of trade out of him wouldn't you oh i think they will i just think that that trade will not be for a, being a number what they one want. right yeah it'll be some kind of draft choice maybe a fourth or a fifth and he comes in as a backup i think he's better than that but i'm in the minority i understand that and uh i do think though he'll get trade you cannot have Justin Williams and Caleb, or excuse me, Justin Fields and Caleb Williams on the same team. Because if you're Caleb Williams, you're always looking over your shoulder. If you're Justin Fields, you're saying, I maybe should be playing. And the, the media will hype this thing. The fans will hype this thing. He just needs to go away. By the way, Minshew went to the Raiders. So you would have to think that oh. Fields is not going there. Yeah, that one's done. Did that happen last night? Yeah. Last, okay. I was like, somehow I missed that one. But I agree with you. I don't think Justin Fields is bad, as some people might like to make him out to be. And it doesn't seem like it would be the right move for the Bears to keep him because nothing against Fields, but I would like a more veteran quarterback to be there to help mentor Caleb Williams. Matthew? As Randy would say, what do you have on the text line? Take it or leave it. This is Dylan Carlson's last chance to make himself a Cardinal long term. I, I'm going to take that because I don't see them signing him long term. Mm -hmm. And I say I would say if I'm his representation, play this thing out, hit free agency and see if there's some teams out there that want you to be an everyday player. I'm going to take it, too, because I believe that going into spring training, that it really was up to Matthew Libertor and Dylan Carlson when they got the opportunities to prove themselves. Both of them have a huge chance to prove themselves, and it feels like this maybe can be the last chance that they get. And they have Victor Scott coming. You've got Newt Bar that maybe signs an extension. They look at him as being an everyday left fielder. Jordan Walker is going to be your everyday right fielder. And Tommy Edmond just signed a two-year extension. So it looks like, you know, Dylan Carlson would be the fourth outfielder at this point, which would make it tough in his career to say, you know what, I'm going to stay here long term and probably on both sides. Take it or leave it. The only thing worse than the power play dance is that they play a John Denver song at Blues game. <laughs> I'm going to leave that. People hate. There are people who hate that they play Country Roads. I think it's great. There are people who hate it so much. I love it. And they make me laugh, so uh, suffer. Is, you guys like it? I, suffer. I do fools. like it. I've always wondered what the full story. I've gotten different versions of the story about why it's become a thing. What is the full version of why? I don't know. That? Really? I have no idea. Do you need a reason? I don't know no, why I they just played. I didn't know if there was a reason I I behind think, it. I didn't think there was. It was a I mean, good it was, luck I think charm. It was just or? like. People are going to, you, if you need a call and response song, you need one that people are going to respond to the call. And it's a great it, it karaoke works. song. It works. Yeah. When did they start playing it? Was it in 19? Ooh, that, I don't know. Was. I didn't go to a lot of blues games until recently. They retired really? Gloria. Maybe they person. retired this. I didn't go to a lot of blues games in person. Why do they sing country? Okay, Get another take it or leave it. Why? Well, definitely take a deep dive. Take into it or this. leave it. Alec Burleson may not be Matt Holiday, but he could at least be Alex Verdugo. How about just be Alec Burleson and maybe establish yourself in the league? That's fair. Also, <laughs> Alex Verdugo is like a career like 102 OPS. So yeah. it's like you're just telling me that he's going to be a barely above average outfielder for for us. 314, is it adorable, Dan? You bet it is. It's is it adorable? adorable? adorable. <laughs> So from this article that I'm reading, it was something that stemmed from 2019 and it was an accident, sort of happened by accident, is how the song was played. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll take it. I like it. The fans get into it. I may be in the minority, but I like it. It's a great song.
Yeah, better than like playing like you know Darius Rucker's version of Wagon Wheel. Oh, don't don't get started. Okay, <laughs> quick question for you, Dan. Take it or leave it. You like Darius Rucker's version of Wagon Wheel the best? I do. I'm gonna take better it. Better than the original. Yeah, I love it. Freaking Thank you. Just oh, what happened, Rock? You, uh, this you is a big issue it? that him and I have because okay. I like Darius. I just think version. I just think that we need to. I just think that old Crow Medicine Show's version is a thousand times which better, and Dar- Darius should stay in his lane, oh. which is singing late '90s, early 2000s. Just he's a country singer. Solid. Now. Just solid. He's Hootie and the Blowfish. All right. He does both. Six three six said Country Road started in 2019. That's when I thought it did, and it was in the regular season, so it worked, and they kept on doing it. All right. Makes, Makes some sense. sense. It yeah. does. Yeah. What do you got, Rock? See, he's giggling to himself <laughs> over there. Rock, you got to get on mic me. to say it's this. It's always funny. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I had to react off mic, and then I'm going to uh, read them on mic. The reaction's hilarious. It's not a winning. Uh, take it or leave it. The Cardinals do not have a winning outfield right now. Even if everyone gets healthy, they still do not have a winning outfield. I'm gonna leave that. I think they do, uh, and I think it'll be better defensively. The key is, and you said it, Rock. They got to stay healthy. You, you got to stay healthy and, and have these guys playing 135, 140 games. The, the one thing I would look at is that if you have a deficiency in one of the corners or guys going a rut, you got Alec Burles in there, mm-hmm. win healthy. So I don't know, man. I think it's going to be better than people think. The 314 says during the Blue Stanley Cup run, there was a point where they just through the natural course of play, they were playing country roads. Obviously, you didn't have to cut. You have to cut the song when play resumes. Apparently, they did that, and the crowd just kept on finishing the verse. And the stadium crew said, "All right, we got a little something here." Okay, I like I it. I like that. That's actually that is if something. that's the origin story. That's the definition of organic. And you don't need some like, well, what's the connection between John Denver, West Virginia, and the Blues? You don't need it if you get if you have that as a backstory. That's fantastic. Bob Dylan actually wrote Wagon Wheel. I had no idea. Did he really? Uh, Bob Dylan wrote, wrote the first seventy-five percent of Wagon wheel and like a lot of bob dylan songs where he wrote the first 75 percent an artist came to him and said hey can i take this song and he goes yeah you finish the last 25 percent you can just kind of roll with it and that's what old crow medicine show did i'm getting crucified on the text line man. <laughs> i am getting absolutely crucified <laughs> absolutely look i want to make this very clear i like both versions okay <laughs> please do not get, cancel me or kick me off this show no, i just, promise you i like both versions just, i like darius rucker a lot yeah, I, I do, do too. you like darius rucker he's in, he's He's immensely talented. I'm just messing around. I love Darius Rucker. I loved Hootie and the yeah, Blowfish growing up. Yeah, why don't they come up. after you for that? I don't know. I love Darius <laughs> Rucker. It's, it's legitimately you could come after me. I'm just being. I'm just being a sour pants. I'm just messing with you. Darius Rucker is fantastic. I just that was the first thing me and Brooke ever disagreed with on this show. So it's called a callback, ladies and gentlemen. Take it or leave it. By Flag Day, the Cardinals pitching ERA is over five. Does this include the bullpen? This includes the bullpen. Full staff. I will. Oh, I know. Sorry, sorry. Leave that. You did say starting pitching, yeah, right? Uh, starting oh. pitching, I think, will be over four. It is a rough start to the season, but by flag day, you get all of May to maybe kind of course correct. I'll take it though. But I, I'm what I'm saying is that Sunny Gray does not begin <clears throat> the season in the rotation, yeah. and that's where my over four will come from. Now, I think they won't go deep into games, and I think the bullpen is going to be exceptional. I think the bullpen is going to be a lot better than people realize, and they're going to win more games because their bullpen is very, very good. Now, I could be wrong, but that's where I'm at right now. No, I agree with you. I think 100%. I think the bullpen is the huge difference this season because it was not something you could exactly rely on last season. Now, I know that things kind of blew up early on for the starting pitchers, but still, I like this bullpen this season a lot better. They changed it. I mean, man, if they changed this roster from a year ago, you were saying you can't stand Pat, and they did not. I mean, it is it is changed. They've changed it a lot, but how much better is this roster than last year's opening day roster? And let's let's it couldn't get any worse. You can have the injured. You can have the injured players back for this evaluation. How much better are the Cardinals going into this season than they were last year? I think they're way better defensively. I mean, when you look at what's going on in the infield, so you have Arenado, Mm -hmm. you're going to get exceptional play out of win. You're going to get really good play out of Donovan at second base or even Gorman. I don't think he gets enough credit at second base. I'm not saying he's the second coming of a gold glover, but he's not going to embarrass you. And at first base, you got a gold glover there. Another year for Walker in right field, some seasoning there. Your outfield when Edmund is healthy 
is a he's a plus defender in center field. He actually, the metrics say that he's better than Dylan Carlson. And then in left field, I, I like Dylan Carlson there. I, I don't mind Burles in there. It's not ideal, but Newpar plays a very good left. So I think defensively, they're going to be much better than they were a year ago. And so put we, it this way, they better be. Yeah, they need to be. <laughs> there it is. Now, real quick, because uh, we were continuing this saga of Brooke getting canceled for what I said about no. Darius Rucker. Um, apparently, John Denver actually is the first. So somebody said that we don't pay attention to Blues games in general, Rock and I, because we should have known that. That what? That I guess John Denver was the original for Country Roads. I can't keep up with it. Oh, so, for Country Roads, yeah. They, 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 you know, they're talking about... Uh, Bob Dylan wrote Wagon Wheel. Oh. That's what they were when they said Bob Dylan actually wrote it. They're talking yeah, about Wagon Wheel. But I'm Wheel. talking about with Country Roads that it was also originally by John Denver and yeah. then it was Old Crow Medicine Show. No, Old Crow Medicine Show did Wagon Wheel. Oh, Wagon Wheel. I'm getting Bob all Dylan. these mixed up now. Okay. Yes, we're talking about two different. Yeah, this is, Now I'm getting all. There's too <laughs> much happening the with this. The texture got confused and thought we were saying that I'm Bob Dylan now. originally wrote <laughs> Country roads, which is not true. So much music, so little time there to is. break down. And, and you know what was perfect? The music ended right then. Well, you can keep it going with "Take It or Leave It." I mean, <laughs> the music just ended. Or we in can the segment. just it was break perfect. down the catching situation of the Cardinals. Whatever you guys want. <laughs> the catching situation. We haven't talked about that enough this season, Dan. Uh, I'm good. We? <laughs> Did we talk about it enough for last year for like two or three more seasons? I guess. I, look, the catching situation is going to be fine. Wilson Contreras is going to play, let's say, 100, 125 games. Herrera is going to get in there. He's a good backup, I would anticipate. And when uh, our man is not behind the plate, he's going to be a DH. And he can hit. So I like the catching situation. I do. It seems to make a lot of sense. We should take a deeper dive on that. I think it's been interesting. We haven't talked about that and I mentioned that on the show last week. We have not talked about Contreras hardly at all. No. And going back to this time last year, he's trying to learn a pitching staff. They're all at the World Baseball Classic, and then they start the season, and there were some rough points in the year. Your backup was Andrew Kisner. Now, your backup this year is coming off an exceptional um, winter ball s uh, stint, and we haven't talked about Arenado, and we haven't talked about Goldie, which are two players that have to bounce back. And if they bounce back and go back to the norms of what they played at in their careers, that is significant with this team. It is very, very important. It is. It's just having all those right pieces in place. Yep. It just always seems like the outfield every single season here currently is always the big question going in. So is the starting rotation, so is the bullpen. But it seems like the outfield every single year there's a story. So is this my segment to take it to break since you, you were can. out of the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. out of the office okay fresh take updates from sunny grade spring training and are the cardinals playing it too safe with victor scott we'll talk about that next on 101 espn
back to the opening drive. Brooke, Dan, and Rock here. And yesterday, we got an update from none other than Sonny Gray. I was a little bit surprised because just last week, Dan, he obviously was dealing with a right hamstring injury. And to already see him back on the mound, he threw a 20-pitch light bullpen session yesterday. No issues. He seems to say that he feels fine as of right now. And then he slated for a longer bullpen session later this week, either Wednesday or Thursday. And the Cardinals hope to determine by that time, by that bullpen session, if he would be ready for opening day, which is coming up on March 28th. That is coming up soon, Dan. Yeah. Now, couple here's weeks. a couple of weeks. Now, here's the thing. If he is ready for opening day, is that too lofty of a goal for him? Should they hold him back a little bit and start the season on the injured list? Because that's how I feel personally, is that I would rather not push it. I know that he's saying he feels great, but we know that not too long ago, completely healthy for him in 2023. But in 2022, he did deal with hamstring injuries twice. I wouldn't push it. And a bullpen session is compared to when you're in live action is completely different. So I looked at uh, the velocity yesterday. He was hovering around 92. He can throw harder than that, which tells me he he was kind of baby in it. He was easing into it. And you can extend it to continue to build up arm strength. But are you pushing off and does the hamstring respond to that? He'll get so amped up in that first game. Um, I just think that you look at this and you have to say, we need him for the long haul as opposed to just saying, let's get him ready for opening day. Because you want him, once he comes back, to pitch every fifth day. So that would be uh, the way I would view it going forward. Are you good with possibly? And they haven't announced it yet because, of course, they're waiting to see what happens with Sonny Gray, Miles Michaelis being your opening day starter. And how does that shift things considering how daunting the beginning of the schedule is for the Cardinals? Six-man rotation, uh, I would look at maybe not having, because the way I look at it, you'd have Mats at five, Thompson and Libertor potentially. Now let's that's with Sonny Gray ready to roll. And uh, the things that I would be concerned about, though, is three consecutive lefties. You would have two in one series is you might split up what you do at the beginning of the season and stagger maybe your lefties and put a righty in between them, which is something that you think about normally. And it's not always the case, but you don't like to go back to back lefties. It seems like now you do it with right handers all the time. Seventy percent of the league is right handed. But that is something I think the Cardinals will look at moving forward. It's something that you have to watch for and we talked a lot extensively about the injuries with the outfield because it is a big issue you're concerned about it because we saw what happened last year Dan where you had infielders in the outfield and it felt like they couldn't build up anything consistent wise out there in the outfield and I think that was one of the many issues for the Cardinals last season but I think a lot of people including myself are very excited about what we've seen so far with Victor Scott in spring training he seems to be such a tenacious aggressive passionate player not saying that the other guys aren't but he seems to bring a little bit more of a spark and energy and Jen, John Denton yesterday thinks that we won't see him this year is that something that you agree with I, I would say we're going to see him this year for sure um, so I don't agree with that I think at some point we see him um, now if you're asking me do I think he breaks camp with the Cardinals I don't um, they've got Michael Ciani and that could be off your bench and then Nupar is going to be hurt Edmund is hurt um, and that when I say going to be I mean opening day it, I, I think that's out of reach I would say Edmund definitely is out of reach but here's the thing I mean Chris Crazier things have happened to where you say, hey, we'll take a chance with this guy, bring him up for a little bit, see what it's all about. And if he's overmatched, then he goes back down to the minor leagues. I don't think that that's the path they're going to take. I would say he starts at AAA because he's never been above AA. See how he does that. Get him more seasoning. Let him see better competition than he's seen down in the minor leagues and, uh, and, and see what he's got. The other thing you have to take into account is that the other team has pitchers that are probably working on things too you might not be seeing their best guys and while he looks great in camp when the lights are the brightest in the major leagues you have to take a look at breaking down his at bats and saying okay was he facing a double a guy was he facing a major league pitcher that was working on something uh, maybe not full full tilt to what you see in in uh, in the regular season those are kind of the questions that i would be asking at this point if i was the cardinals who is he facing let's get his feet wet with the major league camp and then also we do we need to push him at this point i would not yet but i i his eta is not that far away no not far away at all just let him marinate a little bit in the minors yeah. but i think a lot of fans are just excited to see what he's capable of doing well that's i saying, am i'm uh, not just I'm, a fan i want to see him i think well because of his speed and 
then we, we've talked so much about base running last season, which I hope that that's not going to be an issue again this year. And we've seen his speed so much during spring training. I want to see that at this level. I want to see Tommy Edmond when he's healthy, possibly him doing that. I want to see speed utilized a lot more this year. I remember when Vince Coleman was brought up, and I know this is the comp for a lot of um, a lot of people looking at Vince Coleman, and they said, man, He's got that kind of speed. And the, the thing that I look at is that his base running acumen puts so much pressure on a pitcher. He puts so much pressure on a catcher. And ultimately, he puts so much pressure on a defense. And those those players, they're kind of few and far between because the game is predicated on power, gap to gap, and home runs. And he's kind of a throwback in that way. Now, he does have a little pop in his bat, but his speed is what's going to get him to the big leagues. It's funny that you said Vince Coleman because if you ask Victor, Victor Scott who his favorite player is, former player, he Vince says Coleman. Vince Coleman. I love it. So I love it. He seems like he also is a student of the game, which, I mean, that sounds simple. But, Dan, as you know, a lot of guys sometimes don't even look back at old former players, and it seems like he has paid attention in the past of what Vince Coleman has been able to do. I look at uh, free agency in all sports, and I think, man, these guys, do they know who Kurt Flood is? I wonder if that's so, too. <laughs> I remember, uh, I can't remember who the player rep was for the Cardinals at that time. But he said, man, I couldn't believe he said it was unprompted. And he said, all of us should be thankful to Kurt Flood. And I, it was a right-handed pitcher. And it was probably six or seven years ago. And I cannot remember. I apologize for that. But having a conversation with him, and he said, we all should be thanking Kurt Flood. And mm -hmm. I think about that every time I hear about free agency in sports. Also should be in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. 100%. As, talk to Tim McCarver about that. And he thinks not only because of what he did um, in, in paving the way for players to make the kind of money that they make but also he said he was just a hell of a player and should have been in anyway yeah which is interesting yeah well that's dan i'm broke coming up next we're going to head to the celebrity line to talk to blues tv voice john kelly and we're going to talk about the blues win last night but also a very special moment we were discussing bobby plager earlier and memories that we had of him we're going to talk to jk about that as well that's coming up next here on the opening drive it's time for a DraftKings at Casino Queen Redbird report on 101 ESPN. Brooke Grimsley here for your Redbird report. Encouraging news for the Cardinals, a sunny gray. After straining his right hamstring just last week, he was back on the mound yesterday throwing a 20-pitch bullpen session. Gray telling reporters that he felt normal. Gray is slated to throw another bullpen session on Wednesday or Thursday. The Cardinals hope to know soon whether pitching on March 28th against the Dodgers for opening day is a realistic possibility. In game action yesterday, the Cardinals falling to the Nationals 11-4. They'll face the Red Sox today. First pitch is at 12.05 with Matt. Matthew Libertor on the mound. The Redbird Report is presented by DraftKings at Casino Queen. Play, stay, dine at DraftKings at Casino Queen.
everything St. Louis Blues as we head into the Blues booth. Presented by Boardwalk Hardwood Floors, a proud partner of your St. Louis Blues. Find your perfect new floor at our four convenient locations and online at BoardwalkHardwood.com. Welcome back to the opening drive. Brooke, Dan, and Rock here. And we head to the celebrity line to talk to the voice of the blues for Bally Sports Midwest, John Kelly. John, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Brooke. How are you doing? We're doing great, especially after that win last night. John, what is it about the Bruins that really brings out the best in the blues with that 5-1 to one win against them last night? Yeah, they played well against Boston both games, obviously. Went in last night 5-1, and they, they had lost in overtime in January in St. Louis, um, a rather controversial play when McAvoy tripped Robert Thomas at center ice in overtime and then scored a goal. Um, but the Blues played really well against uh, the Bruins in both. I think if you look big picture, the Blues have played really well against the better teams. And I think if you, you, know, you look at the Blues, perhaps a bit of an Achilles heel this year, is they've let their guard down against some of the weaker teams in the NHL. So, you know, they lost both games to Columbus. They lose in San Jose. They've lost the game to Chicago. I get you can't win them all. um, But I I do think that the Blues, like a lot of teams, they do play better against better competition. John, where would you rank this goaltending tandem? I'm not sure it gets enough uh, credit, but you look at Bennington, you look at Holfer, and it seems like every game out there they're giving the Blues a chance to win. Yeah, Dan, it's a good point, and we, we've talked about it a lot. I, I would, where would I rank them off the top of my head? I know that's a little tough think, question. <laughs> Not yeah, to, well, yeah, I'd have to go through the other thirty-one exactly. camps first, <laughs> um, at eight fifteen in the morning when I got home at three. But come on, um, J.K., let's go. All right, all right, how about if I rank them at, as fifth best tandem in the NHL? Love it, you know, love it. Yeah, I was gonna, for for sure top ten, Danny. Um, and you know, the more you think about it. I would say top five because uh, Hofer has given the Blues a chance to win on most nights. Uh, he was spectacular last night. So, yeah, that's my short answer. Top five, probably fifth. How about that? I'm going to go through every tandem. I don't care if a <laughs> okay. guy was hurt or not. And I'm calling you later and saying, J.K., they actually were sixth. But that's okay. okay. <laughs> All right. I got nothing but time for you, Dan. You know that. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. We're going to clip that and we're going to put that out there later today, JK, just so you know. Well, earlier we were talking about some of our favorite memories with Bobby Player because, as you know, yesterday was his birthday. And it was just really special that the Blues were able to score five goals in that win last night. What is one of your favorite memories? I'm no, I know it's going to be super hard to choose, but one of your favorite memories of Bobby Player? Well, I, I've known Bobby since I was a kid, and uh, he he was always the same. He was just the, the, the funniest guy in the room, always had a smile on your face, always put a smile on your face. Um, I, I think the biggest memory I have is the night the Blues won the Cup in Boston, and Bobby was on the bench and in the locker room and, you know, sipping champagne and um, drinking out of the Cup and then the flight home. And, you know, I, I went to his party that he had at his daughter Melissa's house. And, you know, I've said many times that, you know, I obviously personally was thrilled the Blues won the Cup, but I was most happy for two groups of people, and that would be the fans, uh, you know, the, the fans who have been with his team since 1967. They finally got to experience a Cup. And also, you know, the alumni, the, the great alumni in St. Louis, people like Bruce Affleck and Kelly Chase and Tony Twist and, but Bobby Plager, an original blue, um, obviously his number's retired. So I think that's my biggest memory, uh, Brooke and Dan, is the night the Blues won the Cup. And Bobby finally got to sip out of the Cup. And obviously he always said, I just want a parade. And he got his parade down Market Street. So it was it was certainly a great couple of days for Bobby Plager and the Blues. Boy, one of the first people I thought about when they won the uh, Cup, J.K., and I mean this sincerely, was you and your family because your dad meant uh, so much and you mean so much to the community and hockey-wise here in St. Louis. I, I, I want to go back, though, to last night, if we can. Um, the first and second lines were shuffled a bit as the game went on. I, I guess Drew Bannisters is trying to figure out any combination, isn't he, just to get this thing going? Yeah, you know, Dan, the Blues had scored four goals in their previous four games on the road trip, as you know. Um, so, you know, what's the definition of insanity? We know what it is. So you have to mix things up. And, you know, he put Butchnevich at center ice between the two kids, neighbors and Bolduc. 
Um, he put him back with Thomas and Kyber a bit, but then went back to that line in the third period. Um, but the biggest story last night was the third line centered by Kevin Hayes with Kapanen and Saad. That, that line was fantastic. I think as a group, they had their, their best game of the season. And whatever um, gets Kevin inspired to face his old club, whether it's the Flyers or the Rangers, or to come back home where he's he's from the Boston area. I don't know what it is, but he always plays well. Um, but I think that the line changes in general sparked the Blues. And, you know, not only did they score five goals, I know the last one was an empty netter, but they had a ton of chances. I think they had five or six odd man breaks as well. So, you know, they could have put up six or seven last night in Boston. So um, the changes worked, at least short term. We'll see what happens tomorrow against L.A., but you've got to mix it up. This team right now, um, until last night was just not scoring enough goals. So um, that that's uh, something the coach has to do, and he, he did a good job last night. And also we had the trade deadline come and go for the NHL this past weekend. Just your thoughts on Doug Armstrong standing pat with this group. Well, I, I think obviously they're sort of in the, the murky middle, if you will, right? You're still in the race. I mean, there's six points out now, and there's still a lot of hockey to go. I think they have 17 games left, something like that. So it's, it's, you know, almost a quarter of the season to go. Um, so you're not going to be a buyer. Um, and obviously, Buchnevich's name was out there. And if the reports are true that, you know, other teams did inquire. Um, so they didn't make a deal. And Doug's a smart guy. And, you know, he's not going to make a deal just to make a deal. So if it would have been a deal that would have favored the Blues short term and long term, perhaps he would have traded Buchnevich. But he's, he's a very valuable pl- player for the Blues. Um, still has a year to go on his contract. But I think if you look at the, the players that were traded at the deadline and around the deadline, Brooke and Dan, it was more of a buyer's market this year. Um, there were a couple of first-round picks changed. Um, but by and large, I don't think teams got as much for players as they did a year ago when, of course, the Blues got first-rounders for both O'Reilly and Tarasenko. So I think this year was more of a buyer's market. And that perhaps is why Butch Navich wasn't traded. And I, for one, I'm really happy because I said, I think he's a very good player. John, correct me if I'm wrong as uh, we wrap this thing up, but I was going through the roster last night and looking at the 2019 roster and Bennington, Shin, Thomas Pareko, Blay, and Sunquist are the only guys left. Even the head coach isn't around anymore. It is amazing the amount of turnover that we see in sports, isn't it? Yeah, it is, Dan, and it's it's um, that's just par for the course. I didn't mention it last night in the broadcast, but last year the Boston Bruins, of course, they don't have many players left from their 19 team that went to the final. Um, a couple have retired, of course, including Bergeron and Krejci, but last year they set NHL records, Dan and Brooke, with, I believe, 65 wins, and this year they have had 10 new players to their organization. Wow. So, Now, this is a team that set an NHL record. I know they lost in the first round. They were upset by Florida, which was a better team than people thought, and they're still a very good team. But you you basically changed the roster by 40 45% with 10 new players on a team that set NHL records last year. So I think that's a good example of why teams have to change for the salary cap, um, other reasons teams have players retire, things like that. But the turnover in sports, especially in hockey now, is is a lot greater than it ever has been. And that's just the way it is right now. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us, J.K. It's always great talking to you every single week. Brooke, thank you very much. And I'm going to stick with my top five. Stand- <laughs> Blues, we, we I definitely had to put won't you check. on the spot, man. You know, <laughs> this is live radio. Hell, I don't know what I'm trying to say half the time. No. So I just go to you the can, professional like you. You can ask me anything you want, Dan, and you know. Well, are you sure about it. that? Uh (laughs) well thank you so much john well as he mentioned the blues will be facing the kings tomorrow at 6 30 pregame is going to be at 5 30 here on 101 espn coming up next hold on hold on how how did you do the fight yesterday i did it i tried my best to do randy style jack but She's yes, gonna be all. She's said. gonna be all humble over here. Like, well, I tried to do my best, okay. and I, I wanted to respect Randy, and I tried really. And, and, and you hit the jack. You got all four. I did ask for the options two times, 
And so I, I feel like that's what I'm trying to limit myself to. That's fair. So yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Dan, believe me, if you want to do it tomorrow, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it today. But if you want to do it tomorrow, the day after, all this stuff, no, you're I'm more good. than welcome because it gives me anxiety. But it's, I, I'm it's totally fine. <laughs> it's give you your anxiety. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so if you want to fight me, a.k.a. the Grim Reaper, <laughs> then you can text in to the Air Comfort Service text line right now. 314-399-9646. That's 314-399. Yo, ho. The fight coming up next. This is Rocchio with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Blues last night with a big 5 1 victory over the Bruins. And that third line, the new third line, doing all the work. Capping it with a three point game. Hayes with a two point game. Sod as well, a goal and assist. 
in, on that line. Blues back in action at home on Wednesday evening, 6.30 p.m. Puck drop down at Enterprise and catch the pregame show right here on your home for the St. Louis Blues 101 ESPN. Coming up, more talk on the Cardinals as Brad Thompson joins us next segment at 8.45. Also coming up later on in the show, the Billikens are going to try to make an A-10 tournament run, and we'll talk with Earl Austin Jr. coming up at 9.30. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American Santa Heating and Air Conditioning dealer. in St. Louis. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers. Time for the fight. You're going to take on Brooke Grimsley and we have a new fighter today and that is Chris. Chris, welcome to 101 ESPN. Thank you for having me. You bet. Uh, have you ever participated in the fight previous to today? Uh, one time I lost to Randy three to two, I think. Hey, that's a good showing. Well, let's see what you can do against Brooke. Here we go. Question one. Steve McNair was the third overall pick in the 1995 draft out of which college? Grambling State, Jackson State, Alcorn State. First one. That would be Grambling State? Yeah. Rock question two, please. Who beat out Mark McGuire for the NL MVP during the home run chase in his record 770 home run season in 1998? Was that Barry Bonds, Ken Griffey Jr., or Sammy Sosa? Sorry, you cut out there. Uh, Chris, can you say your answer again? Barry Bonds. All right. Uh, question three. Which Cardinals legend is the only player in Major League Baseball history to hit 400 as an average and 40-plus home runs? Was it Stan the Man, Red Shandingst, or Rogers Hornsby? Let's go with Hornsby. All right. And question number four. Who is the only coach in NCAA history to win a Final Four championship game with two different programs? Is that Rick Pitino, Roy Williams, or Lou Olson? Uh, Roy Williams. All right. Chris, how you feel you did on the fight today? Oh, uh, so-so. So-so? Well, it's so about 50-50 yeah. or so, so. Yeah, about so-so. All right. Are you, are, are you feeling... Like Brooke didn't eat any grapes. So. Well, Brooke, he said he hopes you didn't eat any grapes. That has become now the... I think people have just figured <laughs> out that is the superfood on the fight at 8.30 a.m. in St. Louis. So, Brooke, did you have any grapes? I keep forgetting getting yeah. to get grapes but i do have and i'll put this on the youtube this is one of you every morning Vita crunchy little breakfast biscuits i've been doing this like since college this is what i eat every single they look morning you haven't good. gotten sick of them yet no really no. yeah wow. and i do this every okay. single day that's impressive all right well share all you want too if you want one i'm good you they, can they, have a little Velveeta they, they maybe <laughs> later they sound so crunchy <laughs> they are and that's why it says crunchy on there i don't like that They're like like aggressively like like I need like a gallon of water to it's eat. It's better them than as well. those Nature Valley bars Ooh, yeah, where those it are just rough. absolutely disintegrates <laughs> those are rough. as well, soon as you start eating it. Brooke, say hi to Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. How are you? I'm doing great. How did you feel about how the fight went so far? Uh, not fifty fifty. Okay. All right. All right, question one. This should be right up your alley, Brooke. Here we go. Steve McNair was the third overall pick in the ninety five draft out of which college? Oh, Alcorn State. All right, Jeez. Alcorn State. Okay, Rock, okay. and people are going to get mad I, about I made that. The, I, I, know, I knew who was going to be answering that. the questions. I just, I thought you'd, I thought you'd you know, Air pause. Uh, who beat <laughs> out Mark McGuire for the NL MVP during the home run chase and his record-setting 70 home run season in 1998? 1998. 1998. Um, it, was, it was a back-and-forth battle between, and Dan, hopefully I'm right about this, McGuire and Sosa, was it not? I can't give the answers yet. I can't give you hints, Brooke. I'm looking at you. Get, you you, no, no. you, get, two, you right. get two options if you want, member. Um, the, the half Randy. Yeah, just go ahead and give me the options. Just the options case. here? Yes. All right, is it Barry Bonds, Ken Griffey Jr., or Sammy Sosa? Sammy Sosa. Okay, so it's on the list, so she's going to take it. 
Oh, quiz, uh, here's question <laughs> three. Which Cardinals legend is the only player in Major League Baseball history to hit 400 as an average and 40 or more home runs? This is going to be like an old, old school one, is it not? Probably. Probably? Yeah. You, a good, you, a, you table talker. This is like you like you can't you're trying to you're trying look, to not, you're trying to full. fish out reads not, from us. No, I see it, what you're doing. Hey, here. You know how Dan was kind of hitting me hard with the reporter questions mm-hmm. earlier. Mm-hmm. I still have that journalist mm-hmm. in me where I'm okay. pretty good about squeezing okay. little details mm-hmm. out yeah. of people. Don't make eye contact with her. I'm Don't not. <laughs> I've got my head down. Um, I feel like this would either be Stan the man or even further back Hornsby. I feel like is a good guesstimate. I'm going to go with... I feel like I should go with Stan the Man on this one. Final answer? Yes. Question four. Who is the only coach in NCAA history to win a Final Four championship game with two different programs? With two different programs? Okay, give me the options on this one. Was it Rick Pitino... Roy Williams or Lou Olson? Ooh. Okay. Well, Roy Williams definitely had a lot with Kansas and the Tar Heels. But I feel like I've actually seen this before with Patino. I'm going to go with Patino. Okay. Here we go, Rock. All right. Chris thought he just did so-so, so that would mean maybe he got two out of four. So the question Brooke has to ask herself right now, you got to look deep inside to core yourself and say, did I get three questions right? That's the real question here. Do we have a winner in this fight? No tiebreaker. Ring that bell. The winner and still champion of the fight, Randy Carricker. The fight is presented by Golf Discount of St. Louis with the most experienced club fitters in town. Why shop anywhere else? Burr, 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 burr. Just, just, just winning, baby. No, uh, no, I'm oh, sorry. Man. You don't get the air horns today. I'm I sorry, Chris. Horns. Brooke took you down today. She beat you three to one. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, hey, thanks, thanks for Chris. joining, Chris. Let's go through those questions and answers. Brooke knew it. Steve McNair, the third overall pick in the 1995 draft. I thought I would confuse her with all those other HBCUs, but it is, in fact, Alcorn State. Good job for Steve McNair. I don't know how you get drafted third overall at Alcorn State. That's just got to be Steve impressive. McNair. Who beat out Mark McGuire for the, 90, for the 1998 NL MVP during the home run chase in his record-setting home run season? Somehow, Sammy Sosa still was able to take the votes and took down Mark McGuire. It was, in fact, Rogers Hornsby, the only player to ever hit 400 with 400 home runs in the same season that was back in 1922 but I mean he's staying the man so I, I would have bet he did too and the only coach in NCAA history to win a final four championship game with two different programs but here's the thing I had to phrase it that way because he technically does not have two national championships right. with two different teams because the Louisville championship from Rick Pitino has been vacated. So while he technically did win a title game See, I, I with was two going, different teams, I knew this answer and he I thought, does not I it, have a title. Roy, maybe. Roy what, Williams, did he not? Roy Williams or? did not win with Kansas. He's won uh, really? three with UNC, none with Kansas, and of course Bill Self, the opposite, winning with Kansas, but none with the Illini and again. So, so he won two championship games, but he technically did not win two championships because one has been pulled away, but Rick Pitino was the answer there. A Brooke Grimsley win today in the fight, three to one. Thank you, Chris, so much for joining the fight and joining the show today. Oh, oh he's gone. gone. He said, "The hell with it, I'm out." Yeah. Um, I, I thought I was going to get you on the technicality there, Rock. That was very good. Thank you. Well Thank done. You. I, I, I had to phrase it that way because. Yeah. It's, 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 wild, it's wild to me there isn't another coach who's done it. It's crazy to me, honestly. I love it. I love it. Good stuff. <laughs> Somebody said, I love that Brooke just reminded me of how my three kids would always table talk when we played spades. You can't do that. <laughs> that's what I do, though. I, that's 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 how you get little tidbits, Dan. As Absolutely. You know, as you get little tidbits out of everybody. So we're going down south to Jupiter. Is that right? Brad Thompson Ooh, coming up? We out? are. Yes, we are. We are. Oh, sorry. I would. I thought. I. I forgot that I should be tossing to this. Dan, I'm still this getting program. used to this. You're I'm still getting used program. to this. I'm used to having Randy over here. Dan is absolutely correct. Coming up next, we are going to talk to Brad Thompson, our friend, about the Cardinals. We're going to talk about Sunny Gray. We're also going to talk about the bullpen and possibly what that will look like. That's coming up next here on the opening drive.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke here, and this year we, we, d we decided that it was time to make a major upgrade to our home by updating our bathroom. We have this house in U City. We absolutely love it. It's over 100 years old, but we don't exactly love our main bathroom. So we decided it was time to make a big change, but this is really the first time we've ever done a renovation like this to our bathroom. So we decided to reach out to one of our great sponsors here of 101 ESPN, and that is ENB Granite. ENB Granite's team visited our house for a free consultation, and they came up with a vision of how to really transform our bathroom. My favorite part of working with them was stopping by their amazing showroom to explore their large sel a selection of in-stock custom countertops, all the cabinets, options it was so much fun picking out colors for our new bathroom jen was the one who was working with us and she has just been so fantastic and easy to work with she had great ideas for us that fit within our budget and that's what they do there at enb granite they've been doing it for over 20 years turning visions into realities so go schedule your free consultation by calling 314-645-9300 or go online to enbgranite.com or stop by their showroom today make sure you mention that i sent you to Jupiter to talk to Cardinals analyst for Valley Sports Midwest and former Cardinals pitcher Brad Thompson about the Cardinals and everything that is going on right now. Brad, how are you doing today? Brooke, I am doing great. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. We're doing really, really good. So we also are doing a lot better because it seems like we have some encouraging news coming out yesterday about Sonny Gray. It's crazy that it was just last week that he was dealing with a hamstring injury. And then yesterday he completed a 20 pitch light bullpen session. What does that tell you about Sonny Gray's status? I know that we're going to have to see a little bit more there, but is that a good sign for him moving forward? Yeah, incredibly promising. And ha I had a chance to watch his side session yesterday. And had I not known about the hamstring injury, you'd have never known. He didn't look like he was favoring anything. He was as intense as ever in throwing that. He's a very meticulous worker. Uh, he looked fantastic. So uh, that is uh, that is great news. And to me, that kind of just speaks to a veteran pitcher knowing himself and knowing his body. Remember, he's dealt with a hamstring injury before. A couple of years ago, bit him twice. And he felt it coming on. And instead of uh, being stupid like I would do, he didn't be through that. And he just said, hey, I'm good. Uh, like, let's figure this out. Let's give it a couple of days. He only had two days of not throwing. 
So as far as his timetable goes, he appears to still be in good shape. Now we'll find out he'll be at the facility today, how he recovers from yesterday, uh, but super encouraging news with Sonny Gray. Don't you think, BT, and great to hear your voice, that uh, you, you've got to be, though, super cautious with what you see, as you well know, in a bullpen as opposed to getting on the mound and, and facing live hitters? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it is different, right? There's that little extra effort that goes into it, and that extra effort could be a little bit more push off the mound or a little bit more on your finish, which can absolutely test those hamstrings a little bit. But I would be more concerned about it with a young player that doesn't know himself as well. Uh, less concerned about it with Sonny Gray. Now, we've done this so many times in the past. You think somebody's good to go, and then all of a sudden they miss a, a lot more time than expected. But I personally am not expecting that with Sonny Gray. So uh, we'll see. You know how much different this rotation looks like if, if he's in there or if he's not. The schedule does the Cardinals, Dan, no favors, as you guys know, in the first month of the season. They need to be as close to full health as possible. They need Sonny Gray out there, and I think that yesterday was one of those signs that they will likely have him there. Well, BT, not only does the starting rotation look different from last season, but so does the bullpen, and there's obvious filled spots currently in this bullpen, but there seems to be some newer faces that are pushing for some of the final spots that could be available in the bullpen. How do you see the rest of this bullpen shaping out going into the season? Yeah, I mean, you, you know what you have at the back end. You know what you have in Ryan Helsley. When he's healthy, he's one of the most dominant relievers in baseball. Uh, I believe that we're going to see a huge bounce-back season for Giovanni Gallegos, who, man, what, what a, it was just a tough year for him. And I know he ended up going on the IL for the first time in his career. And I also know that he was dealing with physically some things well before that, and just trying to pitch through it, being a great teammate and just being a competitor. But I believe that he'll have a bounce back. JoJo Romero had a rough one yesterday, uh, but they believe in his stuff at, at the back end from the left side. But the new arms that they brought in are intriguing. I'll give you one name that is, has stood out the most to me watching is Riley O'Brien. They picked him up from Seattle. And uh, first night I, I got in, I was talking to, to Ollie Marmel, and he brought him up. And then everybody that I have talked to along the way has been talking about O'Brien. He's throwing 97-98 with sync. He's got a sweeping slider that goes the other way. So as a hitter, I mean, you're looking down the middle and you don't know which way it's going to go. It's either going to shatter your bat as a right-hander or sweep away from you. Uh, he has been filthy. But the, the arms that they brought in, Andrew Kittredge has been good. I have not had a chance to see live yet. I've watched plenty of video and just seen him over the years of Keenan Middleton. Uh, they bring in Ryan Fernandez, your Rule 5 draft pick, who's got plus-plus stuff. He's not guaranteed a spot on this team. Ollie talked about him the other day, Brooke, and said, look, he, if he will help the club, he'll be here. If they don't believe that he is the best option, he won't. And it's just it's kind of refreshing after watching last year to have a competition because you have too many good guys in the bullpen. They had to turn through a lot of different guys last year, and there were just times where you weren't really comfortable picking up the phone. I think that this bullpen is going to be much improved, and adding to this rotation, adding innings, adding depth, uh, adding a sure thing is really going to help out this bullpen in the long run. With the issues of Newpar and Edmund, our guest, by the way, Brad Thompson, who you heard for years here on 101 and working on the uh, the television side of Cardinals baseball, with those injuries, is there any chance Victor Scott could break camp and be a part of the Cardinals? I'm still beating the drum. I don't know if they are. Uh, dude, Victor Scott, and uh, you guys have watched him. You guys have talked plenty about him. He is arguably the most electric player that they have. I mean, the guy sold 94 bags last year. He's a threat as soon as he gets out there, and he plays the game. Like, he's out there on first base. He's dancing around. He's in the mind of every pitcher out there. Uh, I love it. I love what he brings, and he's a guy that will go get it in center field. He is a gold glover in the minor leagues, and you think about this, this staff. We've talked plenty in the offseason, Dan, about swing and miss, and they have more of it. But you have a starting rotation that will pitch to some contact. If you don't have Tommy Edmond at the beginning of the season, it looks very likely that you will not have Tommy Edmond at the beginning of the season. Fingers are still crossed with Lars Nudbar. I'm, I'm speaking from a uh, now a former pitcher standpoint. Give me that guy, Victor Scott, in center field that can go get it. You're opening up in an L.A., big outfield. You're going to San Diego afterwards, big outfield. I really think that he can help you. Now, I, I know that they have he's never played in AAA. 
He's still young. There's still plenty of time. And if he's going to be on the roster, he needs to play every day. I would love to see it, uh, and I think that the staff would, would not mind seeing that as well. But I don't know the bigger picture, right, of you know how they view him, where they want to place him, and what that view looks like. But I, just, I like to see him. I just enjoy watching him play. And he's not the only one. There seems to be a lot of young, exciting players for the Cardinals currently. So outside of Victor Sky, who is a, another young player that has just really stood out to you during spring training? Thomas to JC. Uh, so JC came over in the deal that sent Montgomery and Stratton to the Rangers, a deal that worked out very well for them, obviously, as they went on to uh, win a World Series. But so JC, all he does is hit. He, I mean, he's hitting 400 in spring training. He leads the club uh, with 10 hits. Uh, he plays, he bounces all around the infield. Uh, and he's just kind of an old school player. He's got the no batting glove. He's just got that just just dirty baseball player uh, feel to him, uh, a lot like we've seen over the years. Uh, with He's got that, like, Brendan Donovan vibe to him. Uh, he has really, really turned some heads. I've enjoyed watching him a lot. Uh, I think that he's looked good. Cesar Prieto has hit the ball well. He came over in the uh, Jack Flaherty deal. Not a ton of power with Prieto, uh, but a guy that has great bat-to-ball skills. So you see some of the fruits of the the trades kind of paying off. But so JC is a guy, like if you're breaking camp right now, and your goal is just to, based on what you've seen, you pick your best team, so JC's on it. Now, is there a way for him to make this roster without that being the case? I don't know. I don't know if there's like an outside chance, but I know this. The staff absolutely loves him. How about uh, Brendan Crawford or Brandon Crawford and Matt Carpenter? It was not a lot of talk of those two guys. I know they haven't played a ton, but how have they looked down at camp? Yeah, they've, uh, they, so both these guys, and I, like you said, they haven't been in a ton of action. I've seen, you know, I've seen Matt play a couple of times, uh, but what they – First of all, let's start with Crawford, right? Crawford, we know, and I thought the organization did a really good job with laying it out the way they did, Dan, of, hey, this is Mason Wynn's job. This is the kid's job. But we're bringing in something proven behind him. you got a guy that's a two-time World Series champ, multiple-time All-Star, and knows the role, wants to continue to play. He didn't, uh, didn't like how it went out in San Francisco. He believes he has a little bit more in, in the tank. I thought that was such a smart move to bring in somebody like that to back up Mason. So if Mason needs a day off or, you know, whatever, he's dealing with a, a little lingering injury or something, you have somebody in Crawford. And I think that he's taken to that role really well. We'll see him get more and more action. We saw him in games uh, over, over the weekend. But I love the pickup, and everybody in the clubhouse has loved his addition. He just brings a presence with him. And that's the same thing with Matt Carpenter. There were multiple young players that have already gone into the office and talked to Ollie and basically hey, saying, hey, hey, thanks for bringing this guy in. Like, he, he is really – he is a culture guy. And I, I understand, right, a lot of fans are I, – I know when the signing happened. I was on Twitter or X or whatever it is uh, nowadays <laughs> – Fans were not clamoring for Matt Carpenter coming back. We don't realize, and Dan, you know this very well. You've been in the game. You've been around this organization your entire life. Uh, they, not everybody realizes how important having a guy like that is. And he has helped out so many young guys already. He still has to be able to help you win baseball games from a physical standpoint. I believe he can do that. He'll play some first for you when Goldie needs a day off. He can be a DH option. He can be a bat off the bench. But he has meant so much in just accountability of the way to do things right within this organization. And I really do believe that you're going to see the fruits of that throughout the year. And I believe that at the end of the season, or maybe it'll be in a couple of years even, you will hear guys talking about when you're talking to some of the young players and who, who influenced you, who helped you. You're going to hear Matt Carpenter's name come up a lot because he has really embraced that role. How about the camps of Jordan Walker and Mason Wynn? How have they looked? So Jordan Walker looks like a different guy in the outfield. So all that hard work that he put in last year, he was, I mean, he was trying to stay afloat last year. You guys know he got thrust into uh, the outfield. They, they made the switch. He's playing it at the big league level. You got all eyes on you. It was hard. And we saw him grow throughout the season. Well, he took all that hard work into the off season. He's done it all spring long. And I just, I enjoy watching him work whether it's on the backfields or during BP, like every rep that he takes is purposeful. And he looks really, really good uh, in the outfield. From a hitting standpoint, I think that his approach looks very similar 
I still think that one of the keys to unlocking the best out of Jordan Walker is going to be his ability to drive the ball the other way. Dan, you know how he's getting pitched from right-handers. Yep. It's breaking balls down and away. So are, are you going to be able to either A, drive the ball that way with authority because, I mean, he, he is a big guy, tons of power. You would like to see the doubles. You'd like to see the home runs, obviously. Or is he going to be able to lay off of that pitch and give himself an opportunity to hit a mistake? And I think that that's what he is still uh, he's still going through. But, look, he led the club in average last year. This guy at 20, uh, 21 years old now is, uh, is still growing and learning, and that's an exciting thing. Uh, when it comes to Mason Wynn, uh, Mason's number one thing, as we all know, they want him to go out there and play a plus shortstop. Now, Mason is far more driven than that. He's not thinking about just being a glove first guy. He wants to hit. He's hit at every level. And he talked about this a little bit last year, Dan. Talked about the fact that he, uh, at, at each level, there was a slow start. And then he learned the league, he learned what they were doing, and then he made adjustments. And you can see that in the numbers, and he believes that is going to be the case. I was talking to Turner Ward about Mason specifically a couple of days ago, and he said right now with his swing, he's just going through a few different things. He's trying to figure himself out. He's trying to figure out timing, and it takes a while. And especially in spring training, it's very hard to get a good look or a good grasp on what somebody is in the first couple of weeks. Guys are still going through, you know, their, their initial phases of seeing pitches and feeling comfortable in the box. But I believe that we're going to see him get more and more comfortable. If, I mean, if you're penciling him in on opening day, he's going to hit near the, the uh, bottom of the lineup. But I think that he's a guy with a skill set that we could see grow uh, into a bigger and bigger role offensively. Final question, BT. Um, the appetite for the, the club to make sure that Brendan Donovan is not playing left field to keep him because of his arm on the infield, or is that even an issue anymore? You know what? I think it's less of an issue because they're talking about maybe even after this trip, and especially with the outfield in flux, as we were talking about, uh, I think that after this trip, he will end up in there on the west coast of Florida. They're playing Boston today uh, with Libby on the mound, and they'll play the Twins tomorrow and then come back home. Uh, I think that they're going to get him some reps in the outfield. Now, you're certainly going to be careful uh, with Donovan. Donovan had a, a UCL repair, so it wasn't a small surgery for him. Uh, but they're going to get him reps in the outfield, and they're going to need him in the outfield right now. I mean, when you're trying to pencil in your best lineup opening day, if you, you look at it and you don't believe you're going to have Edmund uh, and you don't believe that you're going to have Newt Bar potentially, and again, fingers crossed with Newt, I think that Donovan is a really good option for you. So uh, perfect world. You'd love to be able to keep him on the dirt, but you also have Gorman who plays a really good second base and a great DH option for you as well. You know what you got at shortstop with Wynn. Nolan Arenado is not going anywhere. So I, I believe that Brendan Donovan, his, his value, and he has so much value on the club, might be my favorite player to like watch on the team. But the value in him being able to play all of those positions, that's what they need. Like, they need that guy. Uh, so I think that he's going to have to get some reps out in the outfield. BT, always great talking to you. And just real quick before we head out, this is very important. This is from one of yes, our great I am listeners. Yes, I Tan Brook. <laughs> you're <laughs> awesome. you're going to nice stand. It's a follow-up because this is very important. A big talker last year, John Fitzgerald, asked at our YouTube chat, uh, BT is awesome. Does he still have the green seat, or did he get more this year? He probably owns a whole row by now. Oh, I need I need an answer to this question as well, mm -hmm. BT, because if you do have a whole row, a row out there, I would like one, a seat or two. Brooke, you are sitting right next to a man that started a lie. Rocky -o? And it happened. Uh, <laughs> nope, not Rock. No, okay. not Rocky. I mean, he, I'm sure he has started many a lie in his day. Uh, but Mr. Mr. Danny Mac, right next to you, we had a game one day. There was a foul ball that just happened to land in the green seats. Probably wasn't uh, the best of days. And Dan just said something to the effect of, uh, oh, and there are Brad's green seats. And boy, has that taken off. <laughs> because, I, I, Dan, I, I had a fan yesterday uh, at the ball game standing up in the booth, and they're yelling up, saying, hey, Brad, which, one, which ones can I sit in? I'm like, hey, any of the green ones here at Roger Dean, they're all green at Roger Dean. Pick, uh, pick any one that you want. It's, uh, I believe it's also got its own uh, – uh, Brad's Green Seats might have its own Twitter uh, profile as well. So that is, that is, a, that is a, great, uh, a great lie that you have uh, thrown out there. It lives on, and I, to this day, have still not sat in the green seat. So I'm still working on that. And people legitimately think those are your green seats. 
Oh, for sure they do. Like, Dan, I, and I showed you some of them. I, I would get messages on, like, Twitter or Facebook, people reaching out with, like, like heartfelt stories. Like, hey, my, my dad has never been to a game. I would love to take him. Or, like, like I feel awful. I'm like, I, maybe I'll buy you a green seat. Like, I'll, I'll figure it out. But, yeah, if you're listening now, I do not have those. Uh, but if you have an extra one, I would love to sit with you. Oh, I appreciate it. I'd love to sit with you, Brad. And uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Love you, buddy. And uh, we'll see you when you get back to St. Louis. Hey, I miss you guys. Love you, too. And you guys do a great job. I enjoy listening. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thank you. That, that is BT. I have a quick Wait. story, by yes. the way. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So one time a, a buddy of mine was just – all over me like please say my name on the air please say my name on the air please say i mean it was just i was like uncle man enough <laughs> so finally i said joe blow is uh not feeling well matter of fact it's a serious turn and if you have thoughts and prayers out there for joe blow make sure you send them his way he, but like nine to ten months later he was still getting texts like man i hope you're okay oh everything so it made him never ask again and his poor mother was like what happened to you are you okay, are you okay? And, he, and he was fine he was fine <laughs> but it was my way of making sure he stopped doing that that's just a quick story no that worked out really well i i had a feeling i felt like i remember that you were the reason for the green seats and look yes. i know what bt just said i don't fully believe him because i think he's trying to throw me off so i think i'm <laughs> also going to send him a lot of heartfelt messages until he gets me one of those green seats he'll be able to believe me i know i feel like he has them all right well that was our spring training report with bt and coming up next we have our rush hour reset we're going to talk about what was working so well with that third line for the blues that's coming up next here on 101 espn
the day on the opening drive with a rush hour reset. The biggest story last night was the third line centered by Kevin Hayes with Kapanen and Saad. That, that line was fantastic. I think as a group, they had their, their best game of the season. And whatever gets Kevin inspired to face his old club, whether it's the Flyers or the Rangers or to come back home where he's he's from the Boston area, I don't know what it is, but he always plays well. That was John Kelly, voice of the Blues for Valley Sports Midwest, talking about that third line last night. It's just as expected because that third line has been big all year for the Blues. Of course, Dan, as you know, you have Casperi Cabinet with a goal and two helpers. You had Hayes and Sod with a goal and one assist each. Seven points just from that line last night. It's something that I wish that we probably would have liked to see consistently all season from that group, but you could really say that about the entire Blues team in general outside of the goaltenders. As John said, Kevin Hayes going back home is something that that for whatever reason he plays well against Boston and that third line was outstanding. The uh, the uh, Blues in their last 11 are now 4-11 and 7, just their second road win in that stretch. So they're on pace for about 84 points. You need to get to the mid-90s if you're going to be a team that uh, is able to get the final spot in the playoffs. But you know what? It was a long road trip. Give them credit. And they're taking on one of the best teams in the NHL and they pull out a win. So you always have hope until you're fully eliminated and you know, gives him a little hope to say, look, we took on one of the best teams. We're down. We're are exhausted from the trip and they come out and play well. And that was a good game. And they also got great goaltending again from the backup Joel Hofer. And we talked to John about it. You know, Hofer and Bennington have given them. I don't know where this team would be without those uh, two. I mean, they no have idea. given them a shot to win it when they're between the pipes. I guess that's one of the frustrations that I do have the Blues this season. I know that they are what they are. I think that they're kind of just around a 500 team in general. But because of what Jordan Bennington has been able to to do and give them the season which is I think he's kept them in a lot of games he's the reason they've been able to win a lot of games it is frustrating to me just in that way of wishing that it could have all come together a little bit more where they'd play better in front of him because of what he's doing this season I, I just don't know if they have the talent yeah. you know you look uh, up and down their roster and you think mm, it's just not good enough at this point and slow starts I mean they they got off to slow starts under Chief and in their first periods and third periods over their last 11 games, outscored 26 to 9. So slow starts, trying to play catch up, third periods come in, try to close games out. They just haven't been able to do that. And that's one of the storylines of this season. One of the connection issues for them. Well, coming up, we talked about this earlier. We got a lot of great stories and texts from you guys. We want to hear from you again. What is one piece of sports memorabilia that you would want to have, but you can never sell? What is it that you're taking? Make sure you get your text into the air cover service text line. That is 314-399-9646, 314-399-YOHO. Tell us what that sports memorabilia is, and we'll be sure to interact with you and get those texts in because we had so many good suggestions. That's coming up next here on The Opening Drive.
If you're getting bored with the same old daily fantasy lineup games, here's the new way to play. It's Underdog Fantasy's Pick'em product here in Missouri, Pick'em Champions. Pick two to five players from at least two different teams. You select higher or lower on the player stat projections. You pick your entry fee. You're entered in alongside other underdogs. But don't worry about that. As long as you you hit your picks, you are going to be the winner. That's my favorite thing about underdogs. Super easy to play in all the different ways you can play. Today, a little bit of an NBA slate, but tomorrow I'm going to have blue. I'm going to have Cardinals, and I'm going to have the NBA, and I can put them all in the same entry if I want. Last night, I had a little bit of an NBA entry go in, and my Scorchers didn't go too well, so I didn't win. But here's the thing. I was able to, because of those Scorchers, take my usual entry from just 6x all the way up to 11x on my winning Almost got it. Just a couple points away. You just got to keep chipping away. Again, all the different ways to play. If you're an NBA fan, get on there. If you're a Cardinal fan like so many of you are, get ready for MLB season because you'll be able to play daily pick em with pick em champions with your favorite Cardinals. So Underdog Fantasy, super easy to play and even easier to get started. You just go to their easy-to-use mobile app or underdogfantasy.com, sign up with promo code ROCC, and Underdog will match that first deposit up to $100. Plus, they'll give you a mystery special pick to use on your first pick em entry. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code Rock to get your first deposit of $10 or more up to $100 matched plus that special pick. Must be 18 plus in President's Day where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concern with your play call. 100 Game Board. Visit www.ncpgambling.org. Welcome back to the opening drive with Dan and Rock here. And we have a big question for you guys. We talked about this a little bit earlier and we got some good and interesting text. So if you could get one piece of sports memorabilia, but you can never sell it, what are you taking? And mine was Muhammad Ali's used gloves and robe. It's in the Smithsonian. I don't know if it's still there. It was part of display that they had. I think it's for sale. And it's going to cost you a lot of money either way. But what was yours, Dan? I had Jackie Robinson's signed contract when he uh, agreed to play Major League Baseball. And uh, it's a historic contract for so many reasons. But that would be the one I wanted. And then the other thing that I wanted was Jack Nicklaus's green jacket from 1986. And Tiger's most recent Masters, his final Masters, and maybe yeah. he gets another one, which would be amazing. But those two green jackets would be awesome for me. And we're getting a ton of texts on what people would do for this stuff. It's pretty cool. We are. We got one uh, through and four says an unopened box of 1975 tops. Here's the thing. You can't sell anything. So, like, it, you get that much <laughs> enjoyment out of, out of pulling a crazy rookie card that you can never sell. Yeah, because so like, I, I thought that was. A, I, I think that, that I think that makes the the prompt much better. Is you can't just get something cool and then be like, yeah, so I can so I can you know ship it off for five million dollars. It's something that you want so badly that you can never sell it. You got to keep it. And I feel like maybe you like cards that much, but I feel like there's always a little bit of aspect of cards that is if you hit the big rare one, you're gonna make some money. So since like 19, 
I'd say like 98, maybe even before that, I have every top set in its plastic. What? Yeah. Really? So I still got it. Are which you is serious? Pretty, yeah. Yeah, my mom was like, I, I was a card collector as a kid, and I've got old Stan the Mans and That's Bob Gibson like, and Lou Brock. and Might take like, yeah, ooh. All ooh. kinds of stuff. See, I, mean, I, I don't know if, if I'm trying to think. I don't know enough about cards to know if the tops runs like since '98. If any of them like popped in this whole like the the world of cards re reemerged during COVID, obviously, and it's still like a big thing now. So I wonder if any of those ones you could be sitting know. on some. You could be sitting on some, Danny Mac. I also have scorecards that mean something to me. So mm. I called the game with Mike Shannon and Bud Smith through a no hitter. And so that was back in 1999, I want to say. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and so I still have that signed by Mike Shannon, Jim Jackson, our producer engineer, myself, which is really, really impressive. Not really. <laughs> and Bud Smith. And so it's his no hitter. And I every once in a while I go back and I look at like the lineup that he faced, which That's is so cool. It's pretty cool. And Tony Gwynn was hurt at that time. And I remember we kept saying there's a weapon on the bench for the Padres. Tony Tony Gwynn, and if he comes up, you know, we'll see what happens. And it was late in that game. Tony Gwynn came up, hit a rocket right to short. And when he got that out, I thought he's going to do this. I respect the Texas who are taking this chance to humble brag about the cool memorabilia they do have already. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm reading zero of your texts. I'm reading zero of those no, texts. No, you can read it. No yeah. humble brag. I'm, I'm not letting the humble brag get across here. No, okay. Not happening. Can I, Had can autographed I Pat oh. Maroon. Po oh, sorry. I was actually, that was the one I was about to read because. Go ahead. Here's the thing, Rock, is that I actually had that in oh, my notes. Say what it is. Well, okay. So from saying. the 636, autographed Pat Maroon puck from the Game 7 game winning goal. And I had that in my notes because maybe it's just recency bias, but you were talking about memorabilia that's special to you. And that was a moment that I was lucky enough to be there for. I mean, that was crazy. 2019, everyone remembers game seven against the Dallas Stars. And in double overtime, you have Pat Maroon. And that just really solidified his moment of being the hometown hero. But it just also, I felt like it was that game, Dan. I don't know if you felt this way about it as well, where I said to myself, okay, this team is capable. They have the combination of talent and magic to be able to win a Stanley Cup. How about the final goal in 2019? That puck. Yes. That would mean something for me, too. Or yeah. I actually have a snippet of the goal from Game 7, like a little snippet from the netting. Oh, what? Yeah, that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so one of, cool. One of my... Uh, it's, it's not like memorabilia. One of my favorite things is there's a couple bars around town that have like these framed pictures of Kerber's call written out in oh, the shape cool. of a Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. It's signed by Kerber, and I'm like, well, that's just a, that's a cool piece of memorabilia to have as like a bar around yeah, town. Yeah, for sure. It's, oh, it's, hey, whoever had that idea is great. I like this one three one four. I would like to have Tim Donahue's whistle from when he that he used to fix the all <laughs> the NBA games with. That's a good one. I like that. Is that is a good one. There was another one that we were reading earlier, and I lost it in all the text that we were getting in, but um, some. Somebody mentioned because there's an obscure category of this guys that we haven't really talked about uh vander holyfield's ear that mike tyson bit <laughs> off <laughs> but, but here's the question did it he in a sew jar? it back on i think he did yeah i think he did it was like the very top of his ear and yeah. I, I think he did sew it back on but do you keep it and then put it in a you jar? were going to keep a toe from kansas city <laughs> so because <laughs> then you can take it it's a great story to, if somebody comes to your house and that's like the first thing you have displayed right there it's like well yeah i was at that game and lost a toe is worth it we got this a little bit in the first segment we're getting it again here in the second one somebody says i want the ta i want to tax a dermy rally squirrel <laughs> Well, I don't want the actual rally squirrel no, no, not to be taxidermied. That would get a little gross. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a little macabre. Somebody also said, I want the steering wheel from Dale Earnhardt. Oh, that's oh, awful. Hey, no. What, oh. did Randy just text yeah, in? That's, right? that's Randy. That's, no, that's no, Randy I, who I didn't, texted I didn't that in. I didn't read the OJ text. Okay, no. thank you. Yes, yeah, so there. I knew there was going to be an OJ text, but going back to Stop the rally the squirrel, there's nothing wrong with taxidermy, you know, taxidermy. No. And I said taxidermy, taxidermy, but I think the rally squirrel would be really cool. If you go to the Cardinals Museum that they have, they have a little stuffed squirrel, and it's just a toy one, but I was wondering if they were going to put a fake one in there because yeah. that would be kind of cool you had the rally cat at one point where the rally cat came out against the kansas city royals do you want that taxidermied yeah why not although he ran up the uh the stairs and, and left bush stadium and the poor guy and i i can't remember who it was but he had to go back out 
and oh, that poor kid, and corral the cat that still had its claws <gasps> yeah. sticking out and was getting this poor guy on his arms. Oh yeah, it was. Good. Oh, and then he gosh. let it loose, and it just went right up the steps and out the stadium. That was it. Wow. He got out of there. The cat got out of there, not the guy. Now I'm just thinking about this. Um, I would like the taxidermied uh, Billy Goat. That would That's be good. I, That's I, good. That would be good. <laughs> yeah. I think don't don't Cubs fans have that somewhere? Like not the actual Billy Goat, but they have them. They have like fake Billy Goats all over yeah. the place. Yeah. You know, um, David Freeze's gold uh, jersey from the 2000 from 2012 that he signed saying he was the 11 World Series MVP. That's cool. That that, really I would cool. like that. See, this is the problem here. I said no more, no humble brags. We want to hear hypotheticals, not what you actually have. And just the entire just flood of Texas. Has been like, this is what I have. This is what I already have. No, this is what I already have. You, you humble braggers. Hey, easy, look, easy. If, you, if you're spending money on that stuff, I would brag about it too. That, that would be me. I would have it like displayed everywhere. Dan, when I first moved here to St. Louis, uh, I... I'm not a great decorator, and so I really didn't know how to decorate. I had like a sports wall, so it was like all my media. You know how many media yeah. passes we get? It was like all my media passes sure. and different things like that. I do the same thing. I mean, if if you have sports things that are special to you and unique to you, you're gonna show it off and you're gonna talk about it. This is awful, but Don Dinkinger's eyeballs. <laughs> terrible. Oh, that's what I love. Dan, that. I'm so no. Glad that. It's terrible. <laughs> This, well, is, this is going sideways oh, so quickly. You said it couldn't be. A, it was a humble brag to say that uh, you had it and you had to, you know, talk about it. I guarantee no one has his eyeballs. So I'm just saying. <laughs> They're so bad. I want, uh, I want Byron Russell's jersey from that final so I can just, like, paint a nice handprint right on, right, right on it and just say, no, see, this is Jordan's handprint from when he pushed off of Byron Russell. That would be good. <laughs> Everything you bring up is NBA. I, I love the NBA. I know That's you why. do. And, and you also, love soccer. I do love soccer. I, lo <laughs> I do love the NBA. I have a lot of football and baseball ones, but everyone's taking the good ones. Also, my other thing is that I'm so nostalgic for the 90s NBA because I, I was alive but do not remember anything that actually happened during it. I was more into the NBA when it was Celtics, Lakers, yeah. Bird, Magic. That was phenomenal. Yes. Phenomenal. Yes. Um, well, let's get one more in. Is there one more good one? Because we are, we keep getting a more, and now we're encouraging the bad ones. Somebody which says is Chris bad. Carpenter's rib. Okay. All right. All right. I we like <laughs> this one. Secretariat's uh, mask or blanket. That would be a cool oh. one too. The moth that flew into uh, Matt Holiday. Matt Holiday. <laughs> that was the okay. moth that flew into Matt Holiday. <laughs> that was disgusting. <laughs> that was one of the cra craziest videos I think I've ever seen. It's disgusting. Want, and then they I had to pull the, it out. I yeah. want the, well, who was the pitcher who who said that they, uh, or who was the guy, was it Matheny who got injured with a pocket knife? That was Mike Matheny in the Matheny's pocket knife. Yeah, that was the 2000 playoffs. He was handling a pocket knife, it sliced him, and uh, Hernandez wound up being the catcher. I can't remember his first name. <laughs> yeah, I want, I want, I want Matheny's pocket knife. There's another one. No, oh, no, no, no. All right, all right. We are gonna. We're gonna somebody had to take this to Randy turn. All right, I, somebody had to make the Randy turn at some point. It's gonna be me. Fine. <laughs> I do love what's coming in though. There's some great text here, there, and maybe we can touch on it a little bit later too. Yes. Nine forty-five and rock and roll. But coming up next, we do need to go back to the celebrity line to talk to Billikens analyst Earl Austin Jr. to talk about the Billikens. They're playing here soon, but also the future of things with the Billikens basketball program. That's coming up next here on 101 ESPN.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. Your Blues last night with a big 5 1 victory over the Bruins. They'll be back in action at home, facing off against the Kings on Wednesday evening. 5 30 p.m. pregame show right here for the 6 30 p.m. puck drop right here on 101 ESPN. You want to hear more Blues talk? Go to our Dobbs Tire Auto Center's po- podcast as we talked it over with Blues TV voice John Kelly earlier on the show. And coming up later on today, a little afternoon basketball. 3 30 p.m. is your tip off on ESPN Plus as St. Louis plays in the play-in game with Rhode Island in the A-10 tournament. We'll be talking that over next with Earl Austin Jr. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads up 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? to the opening drive brook dan and rock here and we head to the celebrity line we are going up to brooklyn to talk to billikens analyst earl austin jr and also host of earl time update you can find his podcast on apple and earl how are you doing today Look, I'm doing fine. How are you? We're doing great. So first, we have to talk about Billiken starting AT, A, A10 excuse me, tournament play. And tip-off is at 3.30 against Rhode Island, who they just beat earlier this month. How different are these two teams going into that game today? Uh, it's going to be interesting. I think the difference with us is that we won't have Sincere Parker. Uh, he, he injured his shoulder in Rhode Island, as a matter of fact. And there was a game he had 16 points in about 15 minutes before he uh, separated his shoulder. So uh, we, he won't be uh, with us uh, for this game, obviously, and that definitely takes a, a lot of offensive punch away. Rhode Island's a team that can really score. As you saw, that first game was 94-91. to 91. Uh, They shoot the three pretty well. They got some good guards. And uh, obviously, uh, meeting two times in about a week and a half, uh, uh, it, it's going to be a tough game, no doubt about it. Hey, Earl, it's Danny Mac. Great to hear your voice, buddy. And you hey, did a, Danny. You did a hell of a job yet again on these uh, on these Billiken games. i got to ask you, how many years now have you been doing it with Rammer? This is my 33, I think it is. 33, I believe. Oh, that's all, huh? 33 yeah. years. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I would never put you on the spot about Travis's job. However, there's so much noise around what may happen, So, I, I, and it's been a tough year. So I'm just going to ask you, how has he and his coaching staff handled what's been a very tough year on the court and probably off the court too? Yeah, it, it's been a tough year, but in, in that position, you're just basically – uh, getting your team ready for the next game. You know, you go to practice or if you go to shoot around, they're doing what they can to prepare their team for the next opponent. And I think that's what you, I think on the good side, that's what you've kind of seen because they won two of their last three games going into this postseason tournament and two of them on the road. Uh, we really struggled on the road. And then we win in Rhode Island and then we go on to Olean and win at St. Bonaventure, which we hardly ever do. Uh, some of our best teams winning at Olean has been tough, and we were able to do that and have our best defensive uh, effort of the season. So, uh, obviously, everybody's talking. You know the noise going around, but I think they, they're they doing what they can to keep the team focused and getting them ready to play uh, uh, today in this postseason tournament. Earl, hopefully they will be able to go on a nice run here in the A-10 tournament. So maybe not the end just yet for Gibson Jimerson, but Terrence Hargrove Jr., we know that this is his final season with the Billikens. What has he meant to this program? TJ has been unbelievable. First, how he has developed his game over the course of uh, his uh, five years. I mean, he came in as a high-flying acrobatic athlete and he's uh, developed into just a, he plays every position on the court. He started off this year playing at center. Uh, he, like if you look at the, remember the Louisiana Tech game where he had the magical 28 seconds, he, he did it uh, dunking, shooting a step back three, uh, shooting a three off the, off the, off the, off the, off the pick, things he couldn't do when he got here. And he did it to win a game for us. And he just, he brings a maximum effort, he has that great enthusiasm. He loves to play with the crowd, and uh, uh, folks love him. And uh, I think he just really kind of, you know, kind of what you know, just, just what he's done in his five years. His uh, just his 
effort and but he, he embraced being a hometown kid being you know having that st louis on his chest really means something to him and uh you saw that every time he stepped out on the court Earl, as you well know, Gibson Jimerson is in year 17 of his uh, Billiken yeah. career. <laughs> it seems that way. Uh, as Brooks said, though, you know, it's been an incredible career for him. Do we know one way or another where he's leaning, or have you heard anything about him coming back for his final season? No, I really haven't. Uh, I just kind of I don't know if he's given any indication at all as well. But as you said, uh, it's been a tremendous career for him. He's like P.J., he came into St. Louis, as you think, as a catch-and-shoot guy. And uh, he still shoots it well, but he's developed into just a scorer. You know, he gets the mid-range shot. He attacks the basket and has really elevated himself into a great all-around offensive player while facing every top defender. He's held and grabbed and bear hugged constantly because he moves so much. And just to watch how his he has evolved over his career into one of the best scorers in Atlanta 10 Conference has really been something to see. We're talking to Billikens analyst Earl Austin Jr. as the Billikens get ready to face Rhode Island today at 3.30 in the A-10 tournament. And you were just talking about the veteran players, but let's take a look at some of the younger players because in that last game against the Bonnies, you had Sion Medley with a great performance, but also Larry Hughes Jr. Larry was really good. Larry, and two of our, Larry played well against Rhode Island. He had 17 points. And then he really played well against St. Bonaventure. He really kind of jump-started a second-half rally with – Two consecutive threes. It was, uh, yeah, Larry, when he's been able to play off the ball a lot, I think that really helps him because he can look for a shot more. He comes off that curl screen shooting that mid range jump shot. I think he's kind of elevated his play. Seeing is really good. Uh, uh, it, being a freshman point guy at the major college level, that's tough duty. And, you know, with, my, with Michael Meadows being injured, that really threw Seeing into a full time duty. And he had his ups and downs, as you would expect a freshman, but he, I think he really played a real good full game. He almost had a triple double, had 10 rebounds and 10 assists. In, in, in that game at St. Bonaventure at seven points. And when he plays well, he really passes the well. He's a great on-ball defender, and I think it's I think his future is bright. I think he's really learned a lot and, uh, and did a really nice job in that game. How many teams from the A-10 do you think make it to uh, the big dance? I think it all depends on Dayton. I think uh, we got four quality teams that could do well in the NCAA term and win a game or two. But I think the only team that's probably looking at at large is Dayton. Even though they're a three seed, they were a top 25, and they've, had, they've been pretty good non-conference. But I think Richmond, who won the league, is really good. I think Loyola Chicago, Drew Valentine, has made a tremendous uh, uh, turnaround in one season. And then Frank Martin got at, uh, UMass up to a four seed and a double buy. So uh, two maximum, I think. But we got four quality teams as well. And is pretty good as well, too. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask Earl Austin Jr. about the high school scene and uh, the Final Fours and what's happening. How good is the talent right now? And that's number one. And number two, uh, any team surprise you by advancing uh, and having a chance at a state title? I think it's talent is very good. Uh, one thing about St. Louis, there's 24 teams here in, in the thing, six, 12 boys teams and 12 girls teams. Half of the field are from St. Louis metro area, six boys teams and six girls teams, and they're all on opposite sides of the bracket. So theoretically, you could almost have an all St. Louis state championship game in all six category it probably won't happen class of four five and six but really not a lot of surprises i mean you see a lot of the old standbys like you know the sean and hunted word girls cardinal ritter boys shamanad boys i think uh list of life girls is a very exciting team in the class four they won in class three a couple of years ago that they've done a pretty good job and on the boys side Vianney uh made a big had a big victory over number one sykeston on saturday to get into the uh, semifinals as well in class five. It's their first time in uh, uh, 10 years. And then John Burroughs, coached by Daryl Pee Wee Learn, who's a great player at St. Louis U in Central High School, led the Bombers to their first uh, Final Four appearance since uh, 1953. And so the boys and girls from John Burroughs are also here in uh, Columbia, will be in Columbia. Well, Earl, I know that you were just talking about a little bit there in the high school basketball scene, but I want to go back to college basketball because it seems like this year specifically, and maybe I'm just in the minority here, but it feels like women's basketball, college basketball, has really just taken over nationally. You have USC, their dominance. You have Caitlin Clark, everything that she's been able to do. What have you made of just this year for college basketball, women's college basketball? 
It's been amazing. And like I said, I'm following women, the women's college basketball for over 40 years. You've had great players, great teams, and great programs. But in the last couple of years, it's been building to the point where they, the star power and the juice that you see is with the, the women's game at the college. The t- people are talking about it. Like you say, Caitlin Clark's chase for the record. You've seen, uh, like you say, South Carolina, what they've done the last couple of years, LSU, what they've done. Uh, now Juju Watkins on the scene, Hannah Hildago in Notre Dame. And it's just got just a lot of like, just a lot of star power where you you got NBA players and uh, just everybody, people that are not fans, just watching games, turning out 50,000 people watching to see Iowa in a preseason game against uh, DePaul. And I, I think it's... Uh, it's remarkable how these young ladies have continued to move the needle at the college game. And I think it's because you see them become household names at these places. We're on the men's game. It's exciting, but a lot of the big name younger guys are 19. You don't see them as sophomores or juniors. They're already in the NBA, or they may go to OTE or overseas or G League at night or things. So there's so many other avenues that some of the young stars – that you see on the women's game, on the men's game, uh, you know, you may not see them at the Kentucky or uh, North Carolina. You see them at these other entities. You see them on the Orlando uh, Magic or the Oklahoma City Thunder, uh, the G League Ignite. So I think that's a big difference. Well, Earl, thank you so much for joining us and have fun in Brooklyn. And hopefully we'll have a nice run there for the Billikens in the A-10 tournament. Well, thank you very much. Looking forward to it and great to talk with you. Thanks, Earl. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. You got it, buddy. (laughs) That is Billikens analyst Earl Austin Jr. He also has his Earl Time Update podcast that you can find on Apple. And also, as we mentioned earlier, the Billikens facing off against Rhode Island today at 3.30 in the A-10 tournament. Coming up, we have Rock and Roll. That's next here on The Opening Drive.
Westbrook here, and I want to tell you why I love the Missouri Athletic Club so much. This year, I set two really big goals for myself, and that is getting back into shape. Even though I was in decent shape, I wanted to get into better shape, and also getting back to the sport that I've played my entire life, and that is tennis. And thanks to the Missouri Athletic Club, I am crushing both of those goals. I work out twice a week with Christine. I'm actually going to go see her today because I uh, didn't exactly eat the best during my bachelorette party this past weekend. And then I also hit every single week with Scott. He has been so amazing and helped me get back to just the little details that I really have missed with playing tennis. And they always provide a wonderful experience over at the Missouri Athletic Club. And that's why I love my MAC. You know, end roll. Let's rock, let's rock today. Heading down the stretch on 101 ESPN and the opening drive. Want to tell you about Bracket Madness Pick'em Challenge Selection Sunday. It's almost here. Get signed up to play in this year's Bracket Madness Pick'em Challenge. Register to participate now at 101ESPN.com. It is free to enter. This year's top score will take home a $250 Amazon gift card and a 101 prize pack. See the contestant rules and get signed up to play in Bracket Madness now at 101ESPN.com. Brought to you by Bud Light and Twin Peaks. And Dan, this week is 314 Day. I don't know if you knew that or not. I did know that. It's a big day this week, and I like to celebrate. And if you don't have plans just yet, which you may not, I have plans for you. You should go over to Ballpark Village, the Village this Thursday, March 14th, for those who don't understand what 314 Day is, because we are celebrating all things SEL with a free 314 Day Battle Hawks Town Hall event with head coach Anthony Becht and the Battle Hawks Brass. And guess what, Dan? I'm going to be out there moderating it because I'm I am a huge Battle Hawks fan. The event is free and will also feature fan favorite activities. The Fast Lane will be live at Ballpark Village from 2 to 6 p.m. courtesy of Sumner One. You can get all those details now over at 101ESPN.com. Have you prepared for your big night? I have prepared. I am always prepared because I am a big Battle Hawks fan. Kaka! I've been doing that every show. And okay. so I'm really excited to see and talk to Anthony Beck. We've had him on the show. He's fantastic and is such a great talker and also does really well with engaging with the fans. I uh, be prepared. I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll show up and I'll ask you, who is the second string guard oh, book? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want you as fully prepared as you can. No. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't right. do that. Well, now I need to add some more research to my, uh, fairness, my event on, just in case. Fairness, on that one, uh, I don't think the Battle Hawks currently know who their second string guard is. Probably not. They're still, they're still working on it. It's, it's still coming together. Well, now we have Rock and Roll Rock. What do you got? 
Well, I, honestly, I just want to I just want to give some credit to uh, to to our listeners out here because man, you guys have some incredible memorabilia collections. I tell you what, <laughs> and, and I didn't know it, but and we didn't really ask, but you told us. I, 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 the people in St. Louis just the memorabilia that they have that I'm seeing here today, it's quite impressive. I'm not going to tell anybody about it, but I tell you what, they got Why some memorabilia in this city because I didn't ask it. for it. Well, I am. I'm asking for it right now. Maybe I want to know. Somebody has like the gold. Good job, Somebody bro. has a signed Air David Freeze jersey with the gold outline cool. from the 2007 Game Six. I uh, 11 Game Are six, you no jealous game, because so. you don't have it? Is that what's really going on here, Rock? I'm guessing. I know I'm jealous because I didn't ask the question. People are like, hey, well, here's what I here's what I already have. Here's the cool thing that everyone should be humble braggers. I don't mm, like it. Sounds like somebody wishes it. they had some more sports memorabilia. It's like it's like somebody it's like somebody taking. I swear to God, somebody sends in a picture of, of like a, a signed ball, and they're holding it out in front of them, and just so happens to be that there's like a picturesque ocean behind them. Like, oh, oh, convenient spot for the photo there, fella. Mm. So you said you want to give them. <laughs> Credit, and then you called them humble braggers. That's exactly what I did. Okay, that's what I, I, that's right. what I think it is. I think it was, I think it's a humble brag from the textures today. Anyways, I'm gonna send you pictures of all the stuff I have at home oh, today. Well. There you go. Make sure he knows about it. <laughs> I had the uh, bloody sock from Kurt Schilling. That's good. Oh, that's good. They had Randy Johnson's. Uh, can we get feathers off the bird <laughs> that he imagine? hit in spring training? It was a fastball, and the bird exploded. <laughs> can you imagine you walk into someone's house in like a protective plastic box? It's just a a pile of white feathers. There you and go. There's just a plaque there that says Randy Johnson. Um, I also something from my personal collect. I'd love to have the first goal, the soccer ball. Scored by uh, by City and Tim Parker. I think that would be cool. Ooh, I think that, that'd be very cool. That oh, see, would I'm be gonna, really good. I'm going to give you the different cut, Danny Mac, because what I want is I want the ball that actually creamed off the player because the first ever goal scored at City Park was, that'd be an, good. was an own goal off of a defender, not an actual city goal. So I want the first ever ball that went in at City Park. Okay, that's a good one too. That is a really good one. I mentioned earlier and this is just more of just a nice one because we were talking about memorabilia that you were able to witness Game 7 when you had the Blues and Dallas Stars back in 2019. Pat Maroon, the hometown hero game winning goal in double overtime. I think that would be really cool. But then I just thought about, because we were kind of talking about some obscure ones. Remember how John Hamm was around during that whole Stanley Cup run, especially towards the end? You want one of his scarves? You knew exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> remember, Dan, because remember he had the scarf on like very LA. all the time. It's very he? L.A., but you could also say that the arena is very cold. It is, it is quite chilly. So, there. But I just specifically for some reason remember when you would see him around and he even would come into the locker room. He, we went into the locker room during that Game 7 game and he had that scarf on. I remember thinking, that's a nice scarf. Yes. That would be a, a nice piece of memorabilia. Now we're heading down the stretch. It's time to break this show and get in. Uh, oh, oh, I guess so. Mr. Uh, McKernan, is it not in a block party or balloon party? Yeah, I believe they call like, it balloon I like, party. I like block party. Block party. It is. Yes. <laughs> that there's a lot of people who hate that name. I love that name because I know that the deep cut is that it's an homage to uh, something that Joe Strauss yes. used to say about uh, how how stories in sports were treated in in our town, St. Louis. And so that's I love the I love the Bloom Bar name. Some people hate it, but just Google. Do a little history hunting yeah. and, and find out why it's such a great name for a radio show. Well, that is coming up next. The Balloon Party is coming up next, but great show today, guys. Thank you, Rock. Pleasure. And Dan, it was a pleasure. Pleasure. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. The Balloon Party is coming up next here on 101 ESPN. That's right.